the muscles in your tongue and your jaw. The Indian yogis and the Taoist yogis and the Qigong people believe that uh, digestion starts in the mouth. They believe that saliva is, is very, very important for alkalizing the body, uh, the, the mouth, you know, breaking down carbohydrates. And I just started doing it. I just found my digestion felt better and my teeth and gums have been really, really good. Haven't had any, any problems in, in decades. And, uh, you know, I attribute it to these exercises. Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly, and I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done, and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity training trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and how you can get $1,000 off software licensing when you place an order, that's right guys, $1,000 off, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $1,000 off software licensing when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. This episode is brought to you by the Resistance Exercise Conference, the science and application of strength training for health and human performance. Would you like to learn from the top strength training researchers, network and connect with other exercise professionals from all over the world, join a welcome reception on a Friday night to build relationships with other strength training professionals, experience an early morning workout from an expert trainer to kickstart your Saturday and get inspired, rejuvenated and focused on your strength training business? I certainly do and that is why I am attending and interviewing all of the speakers at the event. The Resistance Exercise Conference will be held on the 9th and 10th of March 2018 in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the Commons Hotel. To get 10% off your entry fee, head on over to resistanceexerciseconference.com, click the registration button and enter Corporate Warrior 10 in the promo code field in PayPal. I'm very excited about this and I've wanted to attend for years. Sign up now at resistanceexerciseconference.com and get 10% off with promo code CORPORATEWARRIOR10 and I look forward to meeting you in person. Hi guys, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the podcast that teaches you how to optimize your high intensity training protocol and your high intensity training business to help you achieve your health, fitness and business goals. My former guests include people like Zero Carb World Record holders, Dr. Sean Baker, rarely interviewed high intensity training experts like David Landau, Dr. Doug McGuff, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Stuart Phillips, Noah Kagan, Luke Carlson, Andy Magnus, and many, many more. My next guest is Steve Maxwell, who joins me for a part three. This is a standalone episode, but if you want to check out part one and part two, go to corporatewarrior.org. Steve is recognized as one of today's most creative strength and conditioning coaches. His talent for constructing fresh, well-rounded and effective mixed modality workouts is legendary. Steve has a long history of competitive grappling. He wrestled competitively through high school and college and then in the US Army. He holds a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. His BJJ competition record includes several Pan American and World Championship gold medals. 
Seized development of joint mobility workouts for dynamic mobility is the latest example of how he integrates multiple disciplines and techniques, producing an effective and accessible system for retaining or regaining range of motion. I love chatting with Steve. He's so inspirational and I always come away from the conversation having learned something really valuable. In this episode, you will learn Steve's morning health hygiene routine, how to fix elbow tendonitis, why a lot of HIIT trainers seem to be out of shape, what he does to relax, and much, much more. For all of the show notes and links for this episode and all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org. And don't forget to hang around at the end of this episode where you will learn how you can get my free ebook and amazing emails. (laughs) And now I give you Steve Maxwell, part three. Steve, welcome back onto Corporate Warrior. It's good to have you back on the show. Hey, thank you so much. I'm glad to be back. Oh, Always yeah. happy to talk to you from across the pond, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I was this morning. It's funny. I I was listening to our second podcast um, in preparation for this one, uh, and. I'm listening to it and I'm just like, oh, why didn't I listen to what Steve was telling me? And it's not that I didn't listen, but I didn't act on or take seriously enough some of the advice you gave. And it's really funny because I had the exact same conversation with John Little, who's a co-author of Body by Science. And he distilled a ton of wisdom to me uh, when we spoke a few years ago. And when I spoke to him more recently, I was like, John, I've only just started to understand what you told me two years ago. And it's the same with you. It's the same in regards to things like the limit of muscle mass, you know, accepting genetic limits, um, some of the mental health stuff, the mindfulness, things like that, which I really do encourage people to go back and listen to that. And I'll put that in the show notes for this one. Um, so I just wanted to start off with that and just thank you for, <laughs> for recording the episode of me and then, uh, kind of not apologizing to you as such, but I've just wanted to, to, wanted to kind of explain to you how it's just now clicking some of that stuff. But I guess maybe that's a, maybe that's an age thing. Maybe that comes, comes with experience and, and maturity, that kind of thing. I was always the kind of guy that needed to hear things two, three, four times myself. You know, it just doesn't sink in sometimes right away. So, no, I mean, yeah, there's things that you'll hear and you'll kind of intellectualize a little bit, but you won't really absorb it. Uh, Sometimes maybe you'll even reject it in the beginning for a short while. And later, after you've had the time to just kind of dwell on it a little bit, it'll come back and you'll start to start to you know, actually absorb it and utilize it a little bit. I mean, this has happened to me many times with many different ideas. Everything from ideas to even physical skills and things, you know. I can remember my early jiu-jitsu days, I'd really be struggling to learn a move. And, man, I just couldn't pull this particular sweep or whatever it was. And it just seemed so hard, and I would just kind of forget about it. And then maybe a year later, it would be like, oh, I get it now. And all of a sudden, it would start working for me. And ideas are the same way. With ideas that, same way. do you do you think does that moment of um, that aha moment often come when you're not actually trying, when you're not practicing, but maybe when you're doing something completely unrelated or when you're resting? Uh, sometimes, yeah, sometimes I've you overthink, that. you overthink things, or you strive too hard. You know, yeah. uh, I'll give an example. This is from the physical world, but it, it, it also could be mirrored, you know, as far as ideas. Um, when I was learning to strike punches, if you try to hit as hard as you possibly can, it's not very powerful because there's just too much tension. But if you hit about 70 percent, wow, it's really powerful and really hard because there's a little bit more relaxation behind it. And I think sometimes even with thoughts and so forth, you're, you know, or whatever, you, if you're striving too much or, or, or whatever, it's, it's almost like you chase it away. Does that make sense? It does. It does. It, the, the, the latter part made sense. I'm not sure if the, the force of the punch makes sense. I don't understand how, how it can be more powerful if it's 70%. Uh, it is. Trust me on that. It really is. I felt it myself. 
when you when you ball up your fist and you, and, and, and you try to hit as hard as absolutely possible, it's actually weaker than if you just relax and hit about 70%. But why is that? You, you, because there's too much tension. The tension actually takes away from the force of the, the, uh-huh. the strike. Got it. But you can you can play with it. Uh, I've actually done this on a, a heavy bag that has like a force meter on it. Yeah. The register, the and it's amazing when you strive less and are more relaxed. The uh, the the strike has a lot more power. How often do you do do you roll and do martial arts these days? Uh, it, it's it's hard when you're on the road. Uh, you know, I'll be sixty five in a, uh, uh, a couple of weeks. And it's, you know, 50 degree black belt walking in a school. I still look kind of young. You know, all the young guys are like, oh, man, who's this guy? You know, they want to try on for size. <laughs> you know, you, 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 can, you can get hurt. You know, you got to be careful. Yeah. So I, I have to pick and choose who I roll with. And, you know, it's you just got to be a little bit more careful than, than I was like even 10 years ago. You know, 10, 15 years ago, I'd just go in and just roll with anybody but a couple injuries later <laughs> you start to get smart it's like yeah <laughs> yeah so i'm in arizona working at a gracie jiu-jitsu affiliate i'm going to be uh, teaching uh, a seminar here this week Great. and uh, the owner of the school is uh, a guy that's a little bit more mature i think he's close to 48 and uh, not a huge guy he's going to be a really fun guy to roll with i'm going to roll with him a little bit later today so but yeah, I get on whenever I can. And it'll be funny. I'll go like months where I'm rolling regularly and then months where I'm not. But I have special uh, mobility and movement routines that I do. They keep me pretty spry because a lot of the movements are pretty specific. And so I can specifically train the the basic movements just on my own, like solo drills. I mean, there's nothing like actually rolling with a partner. But it, it keeps those movement patterns really sharp and it keeps me very mobile. And uh, also works the specific conditioning of moving through these uh, particular movements. And then, you know, doing the uh, the general strength training with the high intensity, uh, it, you stay in pretty doggone good shape. So you can make a pretty seamless uh, exit and entrance onto the mat <laughs> without, <laughs> without too much stress. I mean, you know, the first week or so, you, you, uh, it, it, there's always a little adjustment period. But you can adjust pretty quick. So I've, I've developed these little protocols for myself over the years. So even when I'm not on the mat, I, I can stay pretty mat in good mat shape, as I like to say. Yeah, and obviously, you know, the strength training serves as the, I guess, the foundation, the physical conditioning. But when you talk about mobility stuff that you do when you can't, when you're not rolling on the mat, is that? It, it, is that in terms of the uh, you know some of the crawling that you do, some of the that type of stuff? Is that some of the crawling? To? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I've actually broken down jujitsu into its uh, five uh, component movements. Um, I'm talking about it on the ground now with the ground fighting, mm-hmm. and, uh, and 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 for these five, there's variations of each. And I can actually lay down on the floor here in this living room at this place I'm staying, and, and I can do these movements and keep them wired into my brain. Okay. So because the the brain is so amazingly efficient that any movement patterns that you don't use on a regular basis, it just kind of goes away. It, it's shocking how easily. For example, when I do seminars, uh, I'll find half my audience cannot s- squat. They cannot do a flat foot squat. And it's not that they're not strong enough. It's just that they just never squat. Yeah. Right. Most of them are seated in chairs most of the time. And even the ones that exercise rarely get into a full flat foot squat, you know, ass to ankles and they can't do it. And with just by the end of the seminar, they can't because you just basically remind their nervous system and their brain that it's, it's safe and you can get into that position. No problem. Mm-hmm. So it's that way with any kind of motion you don't use on a regular basis. For example, think of your mother and your father or your grandmother and your grandfather. I bet you if they're anything like my folks, they probably can't get up and down off the floor very easily at all. Yeah. Or maybe not even get down. Most old people, I don't think my mother could get down to the floor and get back up. Now, part of that muscular strength, 
But part of it is because she never gets down to the floor. You know, it's one of the things that separates old from young. You know, young kids are on up and down off the floor all the time, rolling around, sitting, yeah. playing. Right. And older people are really uncomfortable on the floor. And therefore, they have trouble getting up and down. So that's that's one of my theories of, of, of aging. If, if you don't do something, you lose the ability to do it. And getting up and down off the floor is a big one. I think that's like the, the fear of ground engagement is a is a is a big difference between young and old. Mm. Yeah, I think I think I agree. So you're you're basically saying that even if you are, let's say, following a very safe um, and effective and efficient exercise protocol, like let's say body weight high intensity training, um, but that's all you're doing, and you're not doing any of this kind of like. Um, mobility stuff whereby you're not practicing stuff like getting up and down off the floor that even though you might look great and you might be very strong you're not going to be completely capable in your later years that's correct yeah the strength training isn't enough unto itself unless all you do is just sit in chairs or maybe walk from point a to point b but if you want to do any, you know, thing like martial arts, you got to practice that specific thing. Yeah. It's a skill. Getting up and down off the floor is basically a basic motor skill that you'll lose if you don't do it. Falling is the same thing, you know. And the strength training, as good as it is, and it does help you in almost anything that you could possibly do, from climbing stairs to lifting bags of groceries. Still, there's a lot of specific things like falling, getting up and down off the floor, any type of combat or movement, uh, any kind of sports skills. You got to practice those separately. So it all comes down to like, what is it you want to do? What do you like to do? You know, maybe you don't like to do anything and your life really does revolve around sitting at a desk all day. That's fine. You know, the strength training will certainly keep your muscles intact. Uh, certainly uh, provide a sort of basic mobility, but you're not going to be very good at doing anything else. I've had many gu- I've had many guys that are in great shape, man, come to my jiu-jitsu mat, <laughs> looked like Tarzan, played like Jane. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, and, and and because there's also very specific types of strength too. We always used to call it mat strength, you know. My, a couple of my instructors, Helsing Gracie, for example, was ridiculously strong. He never lifted weights in his life, never did body weight counts. He just practiced jiu-jitsu. I hate people like my that. My God, his, his leverage strength. He just knew how to apply it and how to use it and just the right amount. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, of course, you know, jiu-jitsu and wrestling are basically forms of resistance training. It's just that you can't quantify it, you know, because you're resisting against another person. So, you know, your muscles are undergoing stress. It is a form of resistance training. Yeah, I mean, I've never, I've never actually done any. Uh, I mean, I've, I've dabbled in like judo when I was much younger, but I've never tried Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, but I can imagine that it's, you know, very exhausting. Um, and like you say, a, a, you know, a, uh, potent form of like resistance training. Um, I just wondered, you know, do you think, what would be your advice to someone like me who has practically no martial arts background and, you know, I'm probably pretty useless in a, in a fight. Do you think that everyone should have some martial arts skills, uh, or as, as a minimum, um, to defend themselves or just day to day? I, I do. I, I think every, every boy and every young man should be taught the, uh, the fine art of self-defense. Um, even if it's just, you know, good old-fashioned boxing, you know, everyone should know how to handle themselves. It certainly builds your confidence when you can do that, you know. when Like, someone asked my uh, teacher, Helson Gracie, he was the second son of Elio Gracie, who invented Brazilian jiu-jitsu. What is the philosophy of Brazilian jiu-jitsu? And uh, we thought this was going to be good because his English is horrible. <laughs> that, and, and and he he had a mixture of like uh, pidgin English and Hawaiian slang and and, and Brazilian Portuguese. It was uh, quite interesting to listen to this guy. <laughs> but uh, he said, "Win the fight." I says, "Oh, that's pretty good." And win the fight, yeah. He says, "When you can win the fight, you can afford to be nice 
and kind and relaxed because you know it you don't you don't have that insecurity or that fear I thought that was pretty interesting I like that so the 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 the, the key is uh, you fi- you have this inner confidence and just being strength trained isn't enough just being a strong guy isn't enough it well, just simply isn't. There was a very interesting video just recently of the world heavyweight powerlifting champ from Russia it was killed in a street fight by a much, much smaller uh, mixed martial arts guy. Uh-huh. Yeah, it was a video. They actually show, showed the guy, kicked him dead in the face, knocked him to the ground, put his knee in his belly, pounded him out. Guy died. Jeez. So here was a massively strong individual. The guy looked like the Incredible Hulk, and this little guy just totally took him out. So, you know, strength is great, but it ain't enough. <laughs> what was the What was the fight over? How did it? Uh, who knows, man. It was. Oh. It was. It was. Uh, I, I get it's all tragic. these multiple, all these uh, uh, news feeds from all over the world. Yeah. I had this uh, special uh, news program that Taylor makes news that i i enjoy like you do all these likes and dislikes and so you know like everything about trump dislike <laughs> <laughs> everything about mma or or sports or wrestling you know i'm like or nfl football so my news feed is heavily sports oriented well, what? but I, i'll get these bizarre articles sometimes from different parts of the world yeah and uh that 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 uh that video came on i says whoa this is a fine illustration of the difference between just pure power and a trained fighter. It's just not enough. What's the, uh, how do you get that feed? Like, is that a piece of software? Is that a, a browser based? Like, uh, what is this program? Uh, I, I'd have you to can, go in. You could ping it to me afterwards if you want. Just email yeah, it. To yeah, yeah. Wait, let, let me look. It sounds interesting because right. I, I like anything like that where you can curate your news. Uh, let's see. Where is my news here? Okay, here it is. It's called. Uh, oh, it's just called news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an app I got. Easy to remember. And it, it allows you to like and dislike all these different subjects. I love animals and stuff, and uh, nature and travel. So I get this um, all, all the travel news about cruises, airfares, airplanes, exotic places. Um, I, I, I love reading about animals and wildlife, so I get all this really cool stuff from National Geographic. So you, you'll get this all, – all, all the latest stuff will flow into this particular app and so you can read right. about it. It's really, it's really fun. That sounds awesome. I, uh, my girlfriend I, I, like, I, I like historical stuff, mm. so I'll do that too. Go, going back to the martial arts thing, so what would your advice be for someone like me to start? Like where – what specific – martial arts should i look into what would be the most useful like, how well how old are you how old are you now i'm 30 30 oh you're just a kid man <laughs> <laughs> plenty of time plenty of time uh well it just depends what you like i mean people have a tendency towards either grappling well i want to know what the or, most useful is or striking <laughs> yeah. i think gracie jiu-jitsu is one of the most useful martial arts you could possibly do hmm. uh but not all brazilian jiu-jitsu is the same most of the Brazilian jiu-jitsu, especially in the UK, have gone 100% sport, which is pretty useless for the average guy in any kind of street. It's all just rolling around on the ground. Uh, the original Gracie jiu-jitsu from Master Elliot Gracie uh, had a very good combative component to it. Uh, it was his stand-up self-defense. And it was based on the old Japanese jiu-jitsu uh, self-defense. And, you know, every, every kind of situation from knife to stick to gun to a guy trying to punch you, grabbing you in a headlock, uh, strangling you, uh, grabbing you from behind in a choke. There was escapes and techniques to, to defend yourself in every possible situation. Uh, it's rarely taught. There are Gracie combative schools around. I would highly recommend that you Google Gracie combatives. Okay. The only one that I know of is uh, a one in uh, Marple. Uh, near Stockport, uh, there's a Gracie Combatives uh, instructor there. Where is uh, that? Former what, what country is that, sorry? Uh, UK. Okay. Marple. Oh, Stockport. Yeah, uh, of course. <laughs> yeah, near Stock. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I do. I do uh, some seminars there. They're they're affiliated through the Gracie Academy. Okay. 
So that is a very good martial art. Another very good one that's very popular in the UK right now that I, I've been uh, studying and adding into my jiu-jitsu, I like the Russian martial arts, uh, the Sistema. The system can be quite good. How do you spell that? S Y S T E M A. Okay. Basically, it just means system. What type of Russian. martial arts is that? Sistema. Uh, it, it's a little striking and grappling. It's all based in breathing and relaxation. I think you might find it quite interesting. Cool. And it's kind of like the antithesis of strength training in that, that you try to get rid of all the tension in your body because tension creates injuries. Uh, when you're tense or you have a lot of tension in your body or you try to create tension in your body, uh, you basically telegraph your intentions to your opponent. So it's all about learning to relax. Right. And, and, and it's all based on, uh, on breath work and breathing. It's, it's quite interesting. It's, it's what I would call a soft martial art. You know, you have your hard martial arts and your soft internal martial arts. It's definitely what I would call an internal martial art. Whereas it's not based in power or strength or anything. It's based on more uh, relaxation, uh, breath work, and so forth. Mm. So it's a good one. So I've been studying Russian martial arts for uh, a few years now. I go to Moscow uh, quite often, and I have a teacher over there. And I'm mixing those principles in with the Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and it's a really nice combination. Well, where's learning? Pardon? Yeah, you got to keep learning, man. Always, always learning. Yeah, I've, I've realized that. There's always interesting, mm. you know, always new stuff, interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, so you did this really good interview recently, um, which was more like a, I don't know, video workout interview, which was with uh, Brian from London Real. Um, <laughs> which Brian. Uh, <laughs> you gotta love him, man. He's one, he's one of my favorite guys. Yeah, if you want to see these two fit men in their pants, uh, there'll be a link in the show notes. <laughs> so no, I, I really, I really. Yeah, we we uh, we were rocking the speedos, man. <laughs> well, I, I was I was showing him some of the uh, a little morning routine. I it was I, I yeah. I've looked at uh, different health systems from around the world and kind of taken things from uh, Germany and Sweden, Russia, China. You know, every culture has its own little health uh, tidbits uh, Ayurveda from India and uh, I, I kind of combine it together you know di different bits and pieces that you really like and you really feel are useful so I showed Brian my morning routine you know uh, head massage and eye and ear exercises That's right. uh, to preserve your sight and your hearing in old age uh, different uh, ways of uh, massaging the body <laughs> we talked a little bit about the iron crotch uh, Qigong uh, to keep the old testosterone levels going. Uh -huh. There's ways that a person can uh, massage the penis and the testicles to keep the T levels going. Uh, also, your, your thyroid and, yeah. and so forth. And uh, real interesting stuff. And you know, people say, "Well, you know, where's the studies on it, or how do you know it works?" All I know is I've seen some really old Chinese guys that do this that move like kids. Unbelievable. One of uh, my Qi Kung instructors just, just sent me a video of this 81-year-old guy, this Taoist yogi, uh, which is basically Qi Kung, uh, just doing this amazing forms. And this guy moved literally like a 20-year-old. I couldn't believe how mobile and flexible. All, you know, we were talking about hard style, martial art versus uh, more internal style. Every man as he gets older is going to have to go more and more towards that that softer style you know you just can't maintain or sustain hard style hard style would be like wrestling like judo like karate like kickboxing muay thai your body just won't sustain it the softer styles you know being tai chi uh various forms of um, qigong uh, aikido uh brazilian jiu-jitsu at its higher levels uh can be very internal and very relaxed uh, Sistema would be a soft style, internal style. Yeah, like that. I'm far more interested these days in what's sustainable because I've a bit like you. Well, <laughs> not not quite like you in that you've been you've got so much more experience than me in so many different sets of skills. And um, but you 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 when you were younger, you talked about how you felt much more invincible and you would. Um, 
put yourself in very compromised positions and not really care too much. But then obviously the crows come home to roost and you can, you have injuries further down the line. I've had my first taste of injuries um, in the last couple of years. Minor things, things like hip pain, back pain from sport and other things. And it's made me realize, you know what, I need to make sure I'm looking after myself and picking exercises that are safer and more sustainable um so that's kind of i'm always trying to look at everything through that lens now and that's far more interesting to me and what's also quite interesting is i've realized that a lot of my listeners are in the kind of 45 to 65 age bracket which really surprised me but probably hence why they enjoy listening to you steve because you've got a lot of good advice for the uh, anti-aging side of things which um they're obviously far more interested in for the most part well, you, you can pretty much get away with anything when you're younger, and yeah. you do heal pretty quick. My original training was all geared towards being a wrestler. Uh, I, I never got into the bodybuilding, uh, weightlifting side of things. You know, weightlifting was just a means to an end for me, so I guess that was a good thing. So I never was a strength specialist. But, you know, I did your typical Olympic lifting, power cleans, all that kind of rapid ballistic kind of stuff. And, you know, it all works. Like uh, like Drew Bay was saying, you know, everything works to an extent. <laughs> but it, my my opinion now is if you know, it's you're going to get hurt if you play martial arts or rough boy sports. You know, you expect to get hurt if you play basketball. You're going to catch an elbow in the eye. You're going to go up for a layup and get knocked down to the ground. You know, if you play soccer, you're going to twist something or hurt yourself. You know, there's no way you can do uh, judo or martial arts without tweaking your, I mean, but you expect that, right? But in strength training, you should never, ever get hurt. And see, that's something that, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't think much about. I was just all about, you know, weights, reps, wasn't particularly careful about how I did the, <laughs> lifted the weight and the reps. But you can get away with it. And then when I discovered the high-intensity training system uh, in the 70s, uh, and, and then later a uh, subset of that was the super slow, uh, I, I became acutely aware of you know how important it is to use safety in your training and how never to get hurt. But then I kind of went off the rails a little bit. Uh, there was a point, I guess, it's called a midlife uh, life crisis, where I kind of strayed from the fold and started messing around with some of these other training systems i I got heavily involved with um, kettlebells which could be sort of a form of high intensity um, interval training because it was certainly you know but the problem was the ballistic nature of the lifts and some of the questionable exercises like uh, snatching kettlebell overhead and all that kind of stuff there's no doubt that it works there's no doubt that you can get strong and fit it's the sustainability and the injury factor that is the key and i found myself uh, really eroding my joint health with those type of exercises and uh, got into the club swinging. So my point is I'm back where I, kind of where I was back in the seventies and eighties back with the slow, high ten, uh, high, high intensity training. Uh, definitely uh, not into the volume stuff. And, uh, to, you know, I, I kind of learned the hard way <laughs> started, started out silly buggers. Got really sane, went silly buggers, became sane again. <laughs> <laughs> That's very honest of you. I am. I, I'm just curious. You know, um, I love playing basketball. That's my sport, and uh, although I haven't played for a while actually, but I I would like to think that I would play for forever. Well, for as long as I live. Um, is that is that realistic? I mean, obviously, you have to accept the risks, as you were saying. And, uh, you know, the more you play over a longer period of time, the more obviously likelihood there's going to be an injury. Um, but do you think, I mean, for instance, you know, it sounds like apart from a little bit of rolling, you don't seem to participate in as many sports these days. Do you think when you get to a certain age that it, one would be better off just not doing those types of things and focusing instead on mobility and strength training? Well, you can never go wrong focusing on, on, on strength training and mobility. And, I mean, proper strength training will improve mobility to an extent, but then there's specific types of mobility that you, I believe you need to practice over and above the strength training, you know, as a, even yeah. a skillier kind of thing. Uh, but 
back to your basketball, I think it's very sustainable as long as you keep your joints uh, and uh, joint integrity really strong with you through your strength training. Um, it certainly would behoove you to do some specific uh, flexibility and mobility exercises. What would you recommend? Uh, well, even just a basic yin yoga kind of thing could be really helpful. Okay. Uh, I I also think that maybe you should get really good at outside shots. <laughs> 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 make make your three point game really spectacular. You know, <laughs> practice those skills. And and don't worry so much about <laughs> fighting for the ball under the boards and going up for the layups. Do you, do you know what? There's, there's, <laughs> that, that, that's where a lot of the injuries happen. You oh, know? Yeah. yeah. You know, when you're fighting for the ball under the boards and the elbows are flying and bodies are getting knocked to the floor, that type of stuff, you know? Yeah. Fortunately, so, I'm pretty handy from and driving from, from in the there. <laughs> but no, it's funny you should say that because um, there's this, this – I play basketball a um, – pickup session near where i live um not sure if you know steve but i'm actually living in galway now in ireland of all places um so wow. not, not in the not in the uh, not in london anymore so i moved here with my girlfriend who's irish um which we can talk about more a bit later but um i oh, fantastic yeah um so i so the 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 where i play there's a, a guy there who's absolutely massive he's probably about six foot two but he's you know as wide as a tank and you know he's he's the type of guy who's not very elegant and he's just, you know, any, anyone who gets close to him when he's driving to the basket, they are in for some serious <laughs> like shit, you know? And I'm, I'm just like, you know what? I'm not going to play defense on this guy because I care about my body too much. Like I don't see the point. Like it's not, it's just not safe, you know? Um, and that's, you know, partly because he's, uh, you know, he's not an incredibly, uh, what's it, coordinated basketball player. Um, right. He just makes up for his lack of skills with size and strength. Exactly. He can be quite reckless. So I do think about that. I think, you know, I want to play hard. I want to play physical and I enjoy that type of game. But you've got to weigh that up with the risks. And there's no way I'm standing in this guy's way when he drives to basket. <laughs> Well, see, it'd be one thing if you're, you know, making a hundred thousand uh, dollars, you know, yeah. a game like like an NBA <laughs> guy or something. You know, this is supposed to be fun, right? That's but right. getting sma- smashed to, a gra- to the ground by, you know, basically a, a giant uh, isn't isn't much fun. No. So yeah, I'm the same way. Yeah. I, I would be loath to play with that guy. But you know, I don't know how it is in in Ireland, but in the United States, they have these age group leagues. So that you're playing with guys your own own uh, own age, oh, right. and yeah, I used to train a whole bunch of basketball players that were uh, playing in the uh, forty and over league, and from what I understand, they have a fifty and over, sixty and over, seventy and over. So they actually have, uh, the, of course, the players really start to thin out. <laughs> you might have trouble putting together a team, <laughs> but yeah, the, the guys had really a lot of fun. It was all guys, you know, uh, over forty. And they would play at the uh, local YMCA and uh, this other uh, sports club uh, in Philadelphia. And the guys used to come in, and I would just give them uh, uh, regular strength training and uh, some mobility and flexibility work. Uh, Basketball players tend to be pretty, a little bit stiff, a little bit tight. Uh, In in some ways, it pays to be a little bit stiff. You you don't have to be too flexy bendy to play basketball. But, uh, you know, just, just, just things like just keeping your hamstrings uh, nice and supple and your hip flexors and basically uh, kind of, kind of undoing uh, the, the damage that basketball can do. It's kind of like uh, every sport, every activity uh, use some uh, muscles to the exclusion of others. And a, a lot of times it's not so much about training the muscles you use is training the muscles you don't use. So I, I, I've I've applied a lot of uh, corrective exercises and so forth for you know helping people with posture and and help helping keep the body supple. Uh, there there's always a uh, downside to every kind of sport. As soon as competition gets into stuff, the health benefits start to <laughs> start, start start to go. But you know what are you going to do? You're just going to sit around and just have a, a safe life and never do anything. Exactly. I mean, I suppose you could, but I think that'd be pretty damn boring. So, you know, you get, you get in there and, you know, you, uh, you mix it up a little bit and have a little bit of fun. 
but you have to be willing to take that risk. But the risks do get greater as you get older. They really, truly do. So, uh, you, but you can mitigate that stuff to to a large extent. Yeah. So going back to the episode you recorded on London Real, um, obviously we've talked about your morning routine on, on before on my podcast, which is very, very interesting. Um, and it always makes me feel so guilty when I watch you do what you do <laughs> because you do so much. And um, I know you get a lot of stick for it being some people think it's a bit obsessive and, you know, where's the double blind studies and all this stuff, which there isn't any, obviously. Um, but I do wonder whether all of it is necessary. Uh, and I just had some questions. I hope you don't mind me challenging you on some of this. No, um, no, no, no. So for, for, first of all, <laughs> let's say it isn't necessary. Okay. Right. But it makes me feel better. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the important thing, right? The placebo effect is a powerful one. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I just read a study recently where, they compared placebos to actual drugs and the placebos were 37% more effective. Right. It was just like one of my, you know, I get all these um, feeds, uh, d- different uh, news feeds and so forth. It was like, wow, the mind is indeed a powerful thing. But go ahead, ask away. Yeah. The, so a couple of things that come to mind, um, starting with the, you do the heart rate variability and CNS stuff, which yeah. isn't, isn't obviously considered very woo. I think that's quite accepted, uh, among a lot of athletes and, and I, but I'm curious, um, why, why do you think that those, uh, measurements are an accurate way to measure recovery? Well, the resting heart rate has been a pretty long history. Okay. Uh, th- that was started by the East Germans way back, I think, in the early 80s, where they were taking uh, morning resting heart rate of all their athletes. And they were finding that when the heart rate was elevated, uh, that's a sign of stress. You know, if, if, you, if you're under stress, your heart will be elevated. And I've tried this myself many, many times. I chart this on an app, and I even have graphs. And sure enough, after a long flight or after a hard workout, my heart rate will be elevated the next day. Flying is incredibly stressful, by the way. Oh, yeah. 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 And, man, I can see it. The graph is up and down, up and down, always corresponding with workouts, flights, that type of thing. Or uh, teaching a seminar, uh, like a workshop, like for uh, six, seven, sometimes even eight hours. Whew. Very demanding talking like that. And But I can see it. So I know that it's a true measure of whether I'm recovered or not, whether I'm rested or not. I'll, I'll wake up, maybe I'll be sort of like, eh, should I train, shouldn't I train? Eh, I don't feel so good. T- test the heart rate. It's like, whoa, it's up there pretty good. So I guess my feelings were right. The uh, that, that little tap test, mm. I, uh, jury's still out. But once again, it does seem to correspond with the heart rate. Do you ever have days where you're like, oh man, I really want to work out. And then you check your heart rate variability and it says you shouldn't. Yep. And then sometimes I ignore it. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes I just do it because I I think that the feelings, uh, the good feelings generated from, but maybe I won't go all out. You know, maybe I'll do something, you know, like just go out and do a little Zen run and some breath work or something. Or, or some some mobility work. I uh, I use this Russian Slavic health system. It's like uh, all these movement patterns. Uh, really, really nice. Really makes you, you feel quite good. Um, I also use the ten minute rule. If I'm not sure, I really want to work out, but you know the heart rate's elevated, the CNS CNS tap test is off. I'll. Uh, I use the 10 minute rule. If I don't feel better within about 10 minutes of starting to train, I'll just stop. I'll just say, eh, and I'll call it a day. Right. Okay. Uh, but one, one thing, when I'm saying working out, let, let's be really clear. I, I'm not talking about strength training. I absolutely make sure all parameters are clear before I go out there and do a high intensity uh, uh, strength training. Working out, I'm using kind of loose. I'm talking about uh, maybe doing some Zen running, uh, maybe jujitsu, something like that. Crawling, you know, these movement patterns. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess if if you're using the strict definition of exercise, these would all be recreational pursuits. <laughs> yes, Rec- recreation versus exercise. So you know, I'm not kidding myself. All these movement patterns that I do, 
I think, have exercise and health benefits, but I, I don't for a moment think that they replace proper strength training. It's, it would seem to me that if you're not very, if you, let's say you, you check your heart rate uh, variability and it's in a, in, in a region or range where you shouldn't work out, whatever that is. Um, it would seem weird to me to think that um, movement, sort of mobility drills, that type of thing would be that stressful. So are you telling me that if it was at a particular, you know, at a particular range that you would actually just do no type of movement whatsoever? Oh, no, 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 no. I do something every single day, yeah. man. There's never a day where I don't do something. It just depends on how, how intense I do it. You see right. what I mean? I see. On, 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 it might just entail just walking with uh, some breath work. That might be, you know, on a day where I'm really stressed. Right. But, okay. but what I wouldn't do is maybe go to uh, uh, a jiu-jitsu academy and roll hard for 30 minutes or 40 minutes. I certainly wouldn't go out and do chins and dips and, and uh, you know, super slow uh, squats in the bottom two-thirds range of motion. I certainly won't do that. Yeah. You know, if, if, uh, I like to run uh, just for the skill of running. I, I just enjoy it. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't go out and run that day, probably. You know, if I did, it would just be like just like a little little jog or something. You know what I mean? I, I definitely wouldn't be doing uh, uh, crawls or anything like that, the type of crawling patterns or whatever, cross-crawl movement patterns. Nothing like that. Are they quite, so, they're quite, I mean, I'm not, I'm not done a lot of that myself. So is that quite exhausting? Is it too? Oh, man, it sure is. Oh, really? Yeah. It's, you know, you're, you're working, you're, you're really working. You, uh, I, I like the cross crawl movement patterns like that. I feel like there's a lot of benefit. I, I feel good when I do it, but I don't, once again, I don't kid myself. It's the straight training that allows me to do those things. You understand? It doesn't too in too many people's mind. They think they can replace strength training with these drills. No, you cannot. These are specific skills that I enjoy recreationally, and the yeah. strength training allows me to perform them more efficiently. Now, are there strength benefits from crawling? Yes, of course there are. You know, there's no doubt that you're 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 bearing your own body weight. You're using your muscles and so forth. But I. For a moment, I don't kid myself to think that somehow it could replace strength training in my in my routine. And a lot of people do. They think if they go out and play tennis or be, play basketball, uh, you know, maybe do some swimming or something, that somehow, you know, they they don't need strength training. But that's a big mistake because I, I do believe it's the single most important thing you can do to slow down the aging process. Oh, I completely agree. And that's very much the apex of my whole podcast. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the, what we're just talking about there in terms of the heart rate variability and the CNS, what are the two apps that you use? Cause I want to put those in the show notes as well. Uh, I, I just use that instant heart rate app. Yeah. Uh, it's very simple. It's on my iPhone. I just stick my finger on the camera lens and then, uh, the tap test. If you just go CNS tap test on, on the app store. Uh, it'll come up and it's just okay. it's a pretty simple affair uh attends uh, uh your screen will just have like a little timer at the top and the second you start tapping your index finger uh the timer starts and you chart your right hand and left hand and then uh it'll, it'll record the results it shows your ups and downs uh, it keeps a graph over over the week uh month and year to show trends and uh i found it's pretty accurate I mean, you figure, you know, if, 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 if you've not recovered, right, it's going to, it's going to show up in your nervous system. What should, not, what should we be looking for? Like what, how many beats off your standard? Like how, how oh, do we that, that, that's, that's, you have to find out your average. It's going to be okay. different for each person. Oh, and there is a bit of a skill to doing it. So, you know, there's a little bit of a learning curve in the beginning. So you'll need at least a week of doing it before you have a pretty good handle on what your, your average tap is. Uh -huh. And so, same goes for the heart rate variability as well. Trying to get an average over a, exactly. Yeah. You, you know, now we're assumed you're not already overtrained. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I, I recommend if you suspect, if you, if you're feeling tired or you, you're overtrained or you suspect you're overtrained, maybe take like three days off and don't do anything. Literally just walk around for a few days 
and, and see what happens. Mm. You know, if, if you've been training really, really hard. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to start tracking it um, daily. To yeah. I'd be curious to see what you say. Experiment. I mean, yeah. I mean, you, you know, once again, there's plenty of people that don't use it. They just go by feel. Yeah. That's but what I've been doing. I, I, I like a little feedback though, you know, cause you can fool yourself. And, you know, I don't know about you. Do you like coffee? Do you drink coffee, I caffeine? Do. I do. Man, you, you, you can get yourself all, you know, it's kind of like beating beating the horse when it's really tired, you know. You, you can goad your, your system and your body into doing stuff when you get heavily caffeinated that may not be in your best interest, you know. Right. So, because I know a lot of guys that, that really, really need to, to uh, super stimulate themselves in order to get out there and work out. So if, if you need, you know, four cups of coffee before you can work out, or, or some people will take these other types of uh, sports supplements with with the, all sorts of, uh, oh, I'm thinking like I know some people that take uh, uh, ephedrine, for example. You know, that used to be a big one, or Ma Wong, uh, in order to get yourself all up to work out. There's something wrong with that picture, man. If 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 you if you need to super stimulate yourself just to be able to go out and train, mm, I agree. You might want to consider getting a little bit more rest. You know, you shouldn't you shouldn't need uh, all this super stimulation in order to get up and train. I'm going to plug my iPhone in. Uh, my iPad is suddenly it's down to eighty percent. <laughs> yeah, eighteen percent. Yeah, there we go. I have this super long twelve foot cord. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. You've got all the gear. Um, yeah. No, I, I'm not saying that, you know, a cup of coffee or so to go work out is fine. But I know some guys that, you know, you know, there's monster drinks or whatever oh, those caffeinated, yeah. you know, or uh, what's a rock star. I know guys that down two or three of those just to be able to work out. No way. There's something wrong with that picture, man. They, 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 they can't be healthy. And, you know, uh, th- those drinks are so acidic, man. They can really t- uh, tear you up. So, yeah, yeah that, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I know. I completely agree with that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I used to be like one or two cups a day and I'm probably at, you know, the kind of free four cup a day average at the moment, which is probably higher than I'd like. Uh, well, it's probably not that harmful, you know, from uh, what I understand, four cups. Yeah. Depends how big the cups are, you know, <laughs> but yeah, four <laughs> of those is no big deal. But, uh, my, my, my point is though that you can goad yourself when you're really exhausted by exciting your, 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 your central nervous system and, yeah. and so forth and get yourself all hyped up and you're masking the fatigue. So you gotta be careful with that. That's why I like these tests. First thing in the morning, pre-caffeinated, uh, yeah. you wake up, you know, it gives you a chance to just kind of take stock. And I found it just a very, very good tool for determining should I or shouldn't I? The the only thing I remember learning or hearing, I think it was on another podcast, is if some people have an irregular heartbeat, um, that is it true that in some cases heart rate variability might not be a um, a good measure for for this type of thing if someone's got like an irregular heartbeat or other conditions. Well, not, I'm I'm not a cardiologist, so you know that hmm. one uh, I don't know. Maybe Doctor McGuff would know something about that. <laughs> But, you know, uh, all I know is that if my heart rate is five or more beats elevated, I'm usually feeling pretty fried. Got it. And I found this to be true time after time. And it goes beyond just placebo because it, it always corresponds to either a long f- flight or having taught, you know, seminars or workshops, which are very demanding. I mean, just talking for eight hours is really demanding. Yeah. And, um, uh, and or uh, a hard hard physical exertion of some type, whether whether you know a strenuous hike or uh, uh, heavy uh, uh, hard strength training, something like that, you'll see it, you'll feel it. So you know it's not placebo. I mean it's it's just my own physiology telling me, hey, rest, rest. You're under stress. Yeah. All the magic, all the magic happens during rest. But that's such a hard thing to tell these young guys because, you know, they, they, they love the feeling they get in the gym, you know. 
I love the pain. Some, some people are very much addicted to exercise in that uh, they get this adrenaline rush. They use dysfunctional breathing, their upper chest breathing. They get this big uh, hormonal dump when they when they train, and they they just are beating themselves into oblivion. And they'll come in dragging themselves, goad themselves with uh, you know caffeine and coffee, get on there, smash themselves in the elliptical or the treadmill to get that uh, to get that kind of high. But very soon they begin to really experience like a real burnout, adrenal burnout, just tired all the time, and even the coffee won't work anymore. You know you're in a big problem, man, when you have like you know half half dozen cups of coffee and you're still feeling like tired yeah you know yeah you're in big trouble what is your um what do you do to kind of hack flying so to lessen the effects of flying on your health and how do you recover fast from that i've gotten pretty good with this man Hmm. uh you know because i'm in multiple time zones all the time so one one of the things that i found was you know once again the mind is all powerful in this Hmm. the second i get on the plane I reset my iPad and my iPhone to the new time zone. And I, I wear one of those little Fitbit watches uh-huh. uh, that you have to reset through the app. So I'll go on there and I'll reset my watch, my Fitbit, to the new time zone. And then I immediately go on. I start acting as if I'm in the new time zone, meaning that if I got to skip a meal, I would do all fast and just skip. Like an entire meal. All right. So uh, I'll try to get on the same uh, eating plan that I normally would. Um, also, this uh, your your bowel movements are really important. <laughs> Whether anyone's ever talked about this before, but it's really important for your body to uh, regulate itself. And constipation is a real problem with flying. So I'll induce a bowel movement. I'll actually use glycerin suppositories. You know, this sounds pretty gross. Or if I if I haven't uh, moved the bowels, uh, I'll actually use like a, a fleet enema just to get that colon movement. Because, man, you do not want that waste backed up in your colon. You can reabsorb that stuff through the gut membrane and, and you know, basically uh, a form of uh, toxemia. So that mm-hmm. really helps a lot. And uh, if the new time zone I'm in uh, is already at night. Uh, I will resort to a melatonin, and I'll sleep in the plane. Uh, I'll also u- uh, listen to uh, 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 theta, delta, and alpha brainwave meditations uh, that puts you in a real deep sleep. I have a couple apps. Um, what apps? Um, uh, uh, once again, I'm, I'm testing your memory this. again. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I use that Kelly Howe. Okay. Uh, I, uh, off of um, iTunes, she, I, I like her stuff. Uh, they, they, she has all these different uh, meditations that you can listen to mm-hmm. that put you in like a, a really deep uh, uh, state. Really, really nice. Some of them are guided. Some of it's just music. But uh, I, I have one specifically for jet lag, and I'll put these noise canceling earphones on and just go into a zone with the melatonin, and I'll try to get some sleep. Uh, so that when I arrive in the new time zone, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much right on time. Uh, going west is pretty easy. You know, it's just a matter of staying up a little bit later. Going east is much tougher. Uh, much, much tougher going east. And if I get there and I'm really sleepy, I try to make myself stay awake. Uh, the first thing I'll do is I'll go out, take a walk in the sun and try to move myself around. Just a nice little walk try to stay active and stay up as long as I can. If I'm going west, uh, it's usually no big deal. You know, it's, it's, easy, it's easy to stay up than it is to uh, stay awake the other way when when, when you lose. Let's say you arrive in, uh, you know, let's, let's say Moscow or something, you know, and it's 8 in the morning, but, you know, you lost a night of sleep. Staying awake until it's nighttime, well, it's really tough, man. Because what you feel like doing is going to bed and crashing. And then what you'll find is for three nights in a row, you'll be waking up at like 2.30 in the morning. So I've gotten pretty good with that, just resetting the old biological clock. The key is get your meals regulated on the new time. 
tried to get some sleep, the 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 uh, the brainwave apps can really help with that, and as can uh, melatonin, and then get into the bright light as soon as you arrive at your destination, and get, get uh, just get some just walk around in 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 the light for half hour or so if at all possible. And that resets you pretty quick. And melatonin is a supplement. Just to clarify, it is. Yeah, yeah. What, what, it's what your brain produces it. Yeah, I only use it when I'm traveling. You know, I don't. I don't use it every night. But uh, yeah, it's it's a sleep hormone. What, um, Pro- what, what produces brand, sleep? What brand? What dose? A- anything, just anything for the drugstore. Okay. You know, you, uh, I don't think you can buy it legally in the UK. I don't oh, believe. Really? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think you have to have prescription. But in the US, it's no problem. You can just get it all the time. You probably can mail order it. What dose do you, you can, typically take? Uh, if, if it's heavy travel, three milligrams. Mm-hmm. Sometimes even up to uh, six. I'll take two of them. Um, usually one milligram for every time zone I, I pass. Mm-hmm. And it, it really helps a lot. And it's very interesting because I'm, I'm now that corporate warrior is my effectively my full time job. Um, I'm flying a fair bit more, so. I like, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the downside, you know, of how, especially if you need to perform in some way the day after or the couple of days after you land, um, I'm becoming more interested in how I can, you know, make sure I perform better and feel better. Well, here's another, here's another tip. Fly business. Yeah. Yeah. Fly business. It's worth the extra money. I'm telling you, if, if you're going to some place and you're going to have a room full of like, uh, you know, 30, 40 people and you got to really, you know, be sharp and you got to, you know, you're, you're going to be busy teaching or talking or whatever. And you know how demanding public speaking can be. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need to be well rested. I can't afford not to be. So the business classes are fantastic. The, you know, the seats lay down in a nice bed. I, I mean, OK, anything under usually four hours. No big deal. But if I'm going like 10, 12, 14 hour flights, I'm going business. <laughs> and you, there's so many ways that you can get these upgrades and get really cheap seats by using airline sponsored credit cards, you know, point systems, you know, yeah. um, I'm platinum this and that for so many different airlines. And, you know, using the airline sponsored credit cards, you, you just get so many points. So, it ends up really not being all that much more expensive than flying economy. Mm. And it's worth every penny when you do what I do. You cannot afford a, a sleepless, uncomfortable night, you know, cramped in, 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 in an economy row back there. So the business uh, class is, is worth, for me, it's worth it. I, could, so, you know, I completely agree. It um, makes a huge difference uh, in your comfort with yeah. your flight. No, that's really good advice. Um, go, I keep, I keep digressing, but it's good stuff because I like to, I'm, I'm interested in these things, but I want to go back to this, uh, to the workout you did, um, and the morning routine you did with London Real. Um, so you were doing, as we were alluding to earlier, you were doing a lot of these different exercises, um, for different things, you know, the face, eyesight, the tongue, brushing the skin, all of that sort of stuff. Um, where I guess some things I, I I, and I don't want to be, you know, a dead horse here because I think you've already said, you know, I get it. A lot of this stuff people might not agree with, but for whatever reason, I like doing it. It makes me feel good. And, you know, that's why I do it. Um, but I'm just curious. So regarding things like the eye yoga, for instance, um, where I, I, don't necessarily understand where the value might be is if you're using your eyes all day if you're let's say you're walking outside you're focusing on things at a distance you you know you're using your eyes in a variety of ways during the day why would you need to do eye yoga as well like where do you, where do you think the benefit might be well let me start with this yeah i i, I uh had very poor eyesight as a child hmm. i had myopia uh in fourth grade i had to wear eyeglasses uh, 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 nearsighted. Basically, I can see things close up, but not far away. Uh, later, I learned that uh, there's an emotional component to that. It's because you don't want to see. <laughs> there was things going on in my family at that time between my parents, and there was a lot of stress that uh, for some reason I wanted to shut out the world, and I drew everything in close. And uh, over the years, my eyesight was progressively getting worse. 
and I was getting stronger lenses. As and, and I was thinking to myself, my God, I'm going to be blind by the time I'm, you know, yeah. like my grandfather's age. So I, I read this book, Take Off Your Glasses and See. Uh, it was a uh, disciple of uh, the Bates method. This guy was a eye doctor who completely threw out all his conventional belief systems about glasses. And uh, I basically just followed the book. I just threw my eyeglasses in the trash and I immediately started doing the eye exercises that, that were recommended. And I had an immediate improvement in my eyesight and it got better and better as my eyes got stronger and stronger. Then when I went to the summit of the breath masters in Moscow, there was a guy that uh, was talking about doing eye yoga exercises for the muscles uh, of the eye because your, your, your eyes have muscles just like, the rest of your body and just your normal day-to-day routine. You don't really use the eyes uh, as much as you think. I mean, you're using your ability to focus, right? Without thought, but you're not going through the full range of motion with the eye muscles. So you work those eye muscles by doing range of motion exercises and so forth. Uh, and, and he claims he, he fixed his eyes doing, doing these eye exercises. Uh, focusing. Some of these exercises were in the book, Take Off Your Glasses and See, but he had a couple of them that weren't. So I says, what the hell? It only takes a few minutes. feels kind of good. At first, I found it quite hard. My eyes got very tired. So obviously, uh, I wasn't using my eye muscles because it would have been easy, right? Right. But it wasn't. So it was obvious a weakness there that has now since been uh, strengthened. And it's pretty simple, you know, just up and down, uh, side to side, uh, uh, caddy corner, and then circles and so forth. You know, not, nothing too fancy. And it only takes a few minutes, and I always feel better when I get done. And uh, the eyesight improved tremendously over over time. So, you know, to me, it proved it. it placebo, maybe? I don't know. Uh, all I know is uh, I could never drive without glasses uh, before, and I can drive with glasses now. It didn't. It didn't. Hundred percent correct. Uh, I still have uh, s- some. Uh, I think astigmatism. Mm-hmm. Things are a little bit blurry, but I can read stuff, signs, everything from a distance. Where I, whereas I could not do any of that before. So that's just one example, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting when you were when you were doing the tongue exercises. I started doing it with you guys, and I was like, God, this really hurts. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, the the muscles in your tongue and your jaw, uh, the right. the the Taoist yogi, uh, well, the Indian yogis and the Taoist yogis and the Qigong people believe that uh, you know digestion starts in the mouth, mm-hmm. and once again, your your tongue has muscles, and they they believe that saliva is is very very important, and uh, you know for alkalizing the body uh, the the mouth, and uh, you know breaking down carbohydrates. Uh, also, there's things in saliva that uh, help prevent uh, uh, tooth and gum problems and so forth. They, they call it, that exercise is called juice of jade. And uh, where these exercises came from and who had the mind to invent these things, I have no clue. But they've been around for a while. And I just started doing them just, just because I'm, I'm interested that way. And I just found my digestion felt better. And my teeth and gums have been really, really good. I haven't had any any problems in in decades. And uh, you know, I attribute it to these exercises. Maybe I just have great genetics. I don't know. But you know, it only, once again, it only takes a few minutes. And yeah. you know, thirteen million Chinese can't all be wrong, can they? <laughs> Maybe they can. <laughs> I think it's fascinating and I really respect you for, for doing it. Cause you, you, I think, um, you and Brian discussed this and you kind of said, look, for me, it's nothing. For me, it's just a discipline. I just do it. I don't, it's habitual. But I think a lot of people watching it, um, would be like, there's no way I'd, I'd do that every day, even though it is not a huge time commitment. Um, so with that in mind, if you were to take like the critical few and do as much as you could in five minutes, what would be the most important ones for you? Well, obviously, scraping your tongue off and brushing your teeth. You've got to do that. I mean, everyone knows that. Uh, 
In five minutes, you could do a really good brisk head massage, which is very stimulating to the scalp, keeps the sebaceous uh, uh, glands uh, going. Uh, even though I cut my hair off, I have pretty thick, lustrous hair yeah, if I hair. chose to, <laughs> to, to grow it out. Uh, yeah, you, you could get your uh, head massage uh, very quickly, eye, eye and ear massage. And uh, you, you could uh, get a, a, a good uh, tongue swish in about five minutes. You could also uh, add to that the neti pot, the nasal rinse. And it doesn't even have to be a neti pot. It could be just like one of those little uh, sinus squeezy bottles and just rinse the sinuses and nasal out. That, that, that could be an easy five-minute routine. Yeah. And just for context, for everyone listening, I will have a link to the video in the show notes so you can see everything that we're talking about and, and understand the different, the different kind of rituals that Steve has. Um, so you've obviously, as you said, you've taken a lot of these ideas from lots of different places and then you've kind of tested them and incorporated them into your own routine. How do you figure out what makes the cut? Like how, cause there's the thing is, is this is the thing, right? With, with today's, uh, the internet and all the the gurus around people get overwhelmed with ideas of what to do for you know improving health and performance and and so forth so how do you personally cut the wheat from the chaff and decide what goes into your routine well i, I mean I, I used to read a lot i was always interested in health longevity and so forth and i would read a, a, a particular uh, health uh, regimen and then i would try it and if it clicked, it clicked. Like the skin brushing, the Swedish dry brush uh, skin massage, it just made perfect sense to me. And uh, you know, I, I wanted to, I wanted to keep my skin looking healthy with that nice little glow. Uh, do you need to do it? No, there's other things you can do. You can take uh, cold showers and use a really coarse towel to uh, uh, invigorate the skin. But the Sw- Swedish dry brush massage was something that just appealed. And I just would add these things in over time. I was always interested in, in, in uh, uh, Chinese and, and uh, uh, yogic health practices. And I have plenty of time. You know, I, I do because I, I, I've engineered my life so that my time is my own. And I'm willing to put the time in. Yeah. I really am. And for me, it's no big deal. You know, it doesn't take that long. And uh, it makes me feel better uh, physically and emotionally. But for people that are really time constrained, you know, uh, is it absolutely necessary? No, probably not. Uh, the way you breathe and your diet is way more important. So, way more important. So, and, and, if you're, and if you're not strength training, none of this matters. <laughs> if you're not doing proper strength training, you know, forget all this other stuff. You're, you're missing the most important thing you could possibly be doing you know, really working those muscles in a very intense fashion. That's number one. All the rest of the stuff is fluff. Interesting. You could almost create like a pyramid with all these things, with maybe you strength could. training at the bottom. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's number one. Mm. It's the thing that takes the least amount of time, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, as far as when you add everything up, you know, on a day-to-day basis. The strength training really doesn't take much time. Not if you do it you properly. A Cu- cu- couple, a couple twenty-minute sessions a week, man. Yeah. You know, if you do it more than thirty, you're probably wasting time. So I, I uh, a while ago, I started doing some research trying to find the top person on the planet when it came to like skincare and I guess dermatology. And I struggled because whenever I came across someone, they were always invested in so many different commercial products and services that I was like concerned that they would be, you know, legit. Um, so I, I never really found anyone to interview, but I'm very interested because I, I kind of default to the, I don't know if you know the Dr. Bronner soaps. I've used some of their products. So um, I, I use that because it's like, you know, it's the, all of the ingredients are natural and organic versus obviously a lot of the crap and the SLS and so on that you get in, in conventional shower gels and things. But I'm just really curious because I get, you know, I, I sometimes wonder, should you be using soap every day? Um, and also I get dry skin quite a bit, especially on my face. So I'm really curious what tips you've got from like a body wash and, and uh, skincare point of view. Uh, I guess I, I, don't, I yeah. don't use any soap. Right. <laughs> so, no soaps, no shampoos, anything. Uh, every once 
maybe every couple of weeks I may just use a shampoo, but rarely. Of course, I don't have a lot of hair either, but uh, it's just unnecessary. And I think the, the soaps do dry out the skin. Frequent uh, hot showers and so forth can really dry the skin. Uh, the Swedish dry brush massage keeps the skin very healthy. Your skin is your biggest organ in your body, the integumentary system. Uh, it's really important for all sorts of stuff. Uh, it's, 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 uh, that dry brush is just fantastic for just keeping the skin rosy and healthy and keeping your pores clear and, and so forth. I think it's really important to perspire also, you know, you want to work up a, a good sweat, help, helps with uh, metabolic waste and so forth. And I just wash, uh, with a, uh, a cloth, a wet cloth and I'll shower, but without soaps or shampoos. Because your skin is uh, self-sealing. You don't need all these harsh chemicals and all that stuff on it. You're just going to dry it out. And I don't put Mm -hmm. any – every once in a while, like if I'm in a lot of dry – if I'm indoors in dry heat, I will oil myself with coconut oil or sesame oil, head to toe. Just oil myself up. Leave it on there for half an hour and then just take a nice shower and just rinse the oil off. And your your skin's like a baby. Sorry, how often do you do that? Did you say? Um, mostly just during the winter, I'll okay. oil myself good. Maybe uh, once every two weeks. Okay, I'll oil myself. What about olive oil? Uh, is that just as good? Or? Olive oil is okay. It's good. Sesame oil I like better. It's a little okay. bit more stable. But yeah, either either a, a real stable oil. Coconut oil is fantastic. I'm really hairy though. So that's that's not going to be a pleasant experience. Well, you know, <laughs> it, it does feel a little yicky. <laughs> but, you know, you just put it on, walk around for a uh, half hour or so, make sure you don't get the oil all over the place, yeah. you know, and, and then just really give yourself a nice uh, shower mm. and, and, and rinse it off. And then uh, rub yourself uh, vigorously with a coarse towel, which can also replace uh, dry brush massage, toweling yourself off. Uh, a Russian guy in a, a sauna showed me uh, this very – cool way to take a coarse towel when i say coarse rough yeah not like a smooth soft towel but uh, like a cotton towel uh-huh. and instead of putting it in the dryer you just leave it hang in the sun and it, it's like like uh, a very rough texture like a loofah and you vigorously towel yourself off man it feels fantastic it, it's almost the same exact benefit as the uh, dry brush massage. You could do that after uh, a shower. Can no. keep the skin, but yeah, my skin, my skin looks pretty good. You know, my my face. Uh, it does. Even though I, I've been exposed to uh, sun a lot of my life, I've managed to keep the uh, the skin pretty tight. Yeah. Uh, pretty. The skin of my body uh, has really was. I can remember my father even at my age had some real. Uh, crepey, kind of saggy-looking skin, mm. and uh, I believe the treatments I've been doing have, have really kept the skin tone very, very good. Now you're a very handsome man, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> well, I compare myself to my other relatives. You know, my mother, my father, and my grandparents, and you know, I saw the way their skin aged. So I figured that's what's in my genetic heritage. And uh, so, on a comparative level uh, with them, and I can remember back. Uh, I think I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. So I, I think this stuff must be working. Otherwise, I'd be just like them. Absolutely. So basically, what you're saying is I should trade my soap in for one of these brushes. Uh, I would I would say, what do you – listen, it won't kill you to try for eight weeks. I agree. And just you just, just try it. And if, it's, if, if you think it's worthless, don't do it anymore. You know, it only takes a minute or two during the day. I'm going to make a commitment on this podcast that it's public that I'm going to try out as many things as I can from this episode for eight weeks. Just try it. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, discard what you don't find useful. Bruce Lee. You know? Yeah. Bruce Lee, man. Take <laughs> what is useful, discard what it isn't, you know, and, 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 and just try it for yourself. And if you think it's just silly or just a time waster, so be it. Maybe I should go hardcore and do your whole routine. You, I think you should go hardcore. I'll send, I'll send you that morning routine. I'll actually send Thank you the video. Yeah, I, I've and seen it. Look at it. Yeah, I'll, uh... I, I've upgraded a little bit since then. <laughs> cool. Okay. No, I'd love that. Um, 
Okay, now that's answered a lot of my questions around the whole body, the skincare side of things. It's something that I've been meaning to ask someone about for a long time and just haven't got around to it. Um, so last thing on the kind of um, body hygiene side of things. So my girlfriend's recently been complaining to me about my snoring. You know, I'm not even allowed to sleep on my oh. back, Steve, because my snoring's so bad. Now, I am no, I have no doubt that this is something related to something to do with my sinuses, which I'm sure you're going to elaborate on. Um, but is, have you got any views on, uh, I guess the neti pot is maybe one of those things, but ways that people can, uh, I guess, eliminate or reduce snoring, that type of thing? Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's your, your body is being robbed of oxygen. It's, uh, yeah. it's a highly dysfunctional uh, breathing. I'm guessing you may be a upper lobe breather, upper chest breather. Uh, the idea is to get that breath down into the lower lobes. Upper lobes are fight or flight. Lower lobes, rest and digest. We should be breathing in the lower lobes of the lungs okay. 90% of the time. Um, tape your mouth shut at night. Take a piece of tape. This is part of the Butieko uh, breathing system. Perhaps you've heard of this guy. Uh, read the book, The Oxygen Advantage. The okay. Oxygen Advantage. It was written by an Irish guy who was a certified Butyeko instructor. I've done, uh, I learned about this stuff when I went to the Summit of the Breathmasters in Moscow. It was uh, all martial arts related, but they had Butyeko teachers there. Uh, Sistema, uh, the whole martial art is based on breath work. I got real interested in this stuff. And the mouth taping is really, really helpful to force you to breathe through your nose. Sounds horrible, but in reality, you won't even mind it at all. You won't notice it at all. And it'll cut your snoring to nothing. Because maybe I'm being a little bit defensive, but I feel like when I'm awake and during the day, because you've taught me this before about breathing in the... Um into the ad into the diaphragm and into the lower part of the abdomen and i feel like i do that consciously quite well through the nose during the day um although i do sometimes feel like i have some blockages in my sinuses so i'd probably need to address that um but are you saying that it's just could it be that i'm just defaulting to this perhaps dysfunctional breathing at night or do you think no actually i'm fooling myself i was i i know for a fact i was i would catch myself breathing okay. through my mouth and I, my nose would get a little stuffy and uh, I would start default to breath. And of course that, you know, causes that vibration, the palate, you start to snore. So when I started mouth taping, boom, gone. Interesting. My, my girlfriend too has a snoring problem and uh, both of us, it diminished greatly. You can still snore sometimes even with the mouth tape, but it's really minimal. And it's usually because your head or neck gets in a weird position at night. Uh -huh. We'll just not nudge one another and you turn and then it stops. But yeah, we, we used to be uh, pretty heavily snoring. You know, I don't know whether you can see, but I broke my nose a number of times in my athletic career. Mm -hmm. So I have a deviated septum a little bit. And uh, uh, I've learned nasal uh, clearing techniques. The neti pot helps. Uh, yeah. I was rolfed by a rolfer, certified rolfer that went up in there with the fingers and realigned uh, a bit, helped straighten things out. Mm -hmm. And uh, also during cold weather, uh, if you put a drop of ghee or oil in the nose, it really helps keep the nose open in cold weather. Like I was just in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, and it was pretty chilly during the morning, which I wasn't used to. Uh, and I noticed that if you uh, put oil in the nose, nasal passages, it really helps keep the nose open when you're in that like real, real cold weather. Really, really nice. So it's a little technique for nasal breathing in 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 the cold. That's interesting because I actually had a I had a very crooked nose when I was younger, um, and it was so it was it was you know, um, aesthetically crooked, like on the outside. Uh, but I also had a deviated septum as well. So I had to have, um, septoplasty to uh -huh. sort out my septum. So I had that done and I actually had rhinoplasty as well. Um, so I actually had a nose job basically, um, uh, to straighten all of that out. So I do sometimes wonder whilst my breathing is better than it was before, way better through my nose, it still could be improved through perhaps, 
uh, to 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 remove some of these uh, small blockages that I sometimes experience using some of these methods that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean it's pretty simple, and mm. you know it, it's definitely not painful or anything like that. Uh, and just try it out and see for mm-hmm. yourself. You know, it, it really works. Uh, when you when you train heavily, do you find yourself going to the mouth? I was going to ask you about this. So um, I I will start. So obviously we're talking about you know high intensity strength training, which can be quite intense. Um, so I tend to or even or even basketball when you're sprinting up and down the court. Not that's a good question. Not conscious of, of it during basketball, but during obviously during something like strength training, where it's more kind of I'm more mindful of my uh, physiology. I will try and breathe through my nose at the start of the set, but certainly towards the end of the set where I'm really building up oxygen debt, that's where I'm going to do in and out through the mouth. Do, do you make noise? Like grunts? No. No. Okay, good. Yeah, no. good. Yeah, as no long as you're not making a maneuver or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. You hear a lot of that with with people as you uh, begin to hit muscular failure. I call it panic breathing. Yeah. But there is a way that you can learn to inhale through the nose the entire time with uh, mouth ex- exhales and keep yeah. the uh, oxygen in the lower uh, lobes of the lungs. Because once once you start mouth breathing and going to the upper chest, you begin to panic and it's hard to maintain form. Yeah. You get that mammalian panic reflex thing going next thing you know uh i've seen clients and people writhing and twisting and breaking form and do almost like they're doing anything they can to avoid uh momentary muscular failure but you can override that with the breathing you can stay calm calm as can be even work your muscles to total paralysis with no change in form whatsoever it almost looks like someone just turned off the electricity and you just stopped functioning and the form remains the same throughout. And the breathing really helps uh, uh, squelch and any type of panic that you would feel and helps you maintain that that control. Okay. Do you... and, and so it, it's, it's uh, all nasal. And then only when I start to get the oxygen debt will I start to exhale the CO2 through my mouth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm going to be a lot more conscious of that going forward and seeing if I can uh, improve that that way of breathing. Uh, and watch it, watch, watch yeah. on the basketball court too when okay. you're playing I sports will. and stuff that you don't start to gulp and gasp and and, and so forth. Okay, you see, you hear it all the time, uh, especially in jujitsu. You know, when you're rolling around on the mat, you you hear people grunting and gasping and, and and making guttural noises and stuff. It's all all part of panic breathing, uh, just functional breathing. Do you have any good resources on this for more, like, further reading? Any books? Well, I, I really recommend that Oxygen Advantage. I think okay. that's just fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a real fan of uh, the book Yako system. And like I say, it was uh, a fellow Irishman that wrote the, the book. Uh, I'm trying to think of this guy's name. Uh, McEwen, I believe, is his last name. Okay. I, I, I know I had, a, I had a listener submit a criticism of that book or that study um saying that it was debunked have you seen the criticisms do you have you responded to any of that at all no uh because it's the same basic uh it's the same basic uh uh breathing system used in systema for me it's worked great it changed my life it made it, it just made exercise and, and everything uh much more uh effective for me Okay. And I found it really, really does keep you from panicking. Interesting. Uh, especially especially in a game like jiu-jitsu where some guy's like squeezing you and putting you in the, a really bad hold. I mean, that, that, that is a type of panic. Man, I use that, 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 that calm breathing technique and feel really, really good. Uh, I'm sure Western medicine has a, a bone to pick. The doctor himself, but Yeager, was hated by Orthodox medicine back in his day. Uh, they tried to murder him. I believe he was murdered, actually. Yeah, yeah. It, it was like really bad. They uh, they they absolutely hated what he stood for because he was basically debunking Orthodox medicine. So of course, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, haters out there. You know, all I can tell people is try it for yourself, man. Try it for yourself. You'll see how effective it is. Got it. Just you know, try try stuff. People people you know need need to be a little experimental. Try things. 
Yeah. So yeah, I feel like say for yourself. I'm I'm open. I'm open to it, and uh, certainly some other things that we're going to come on to, which I have been experimenting with. Um, but and this is another one of those things which I might try. Oh, well, I certainly, actually, from a, the breathing stuff, I certainly will. Um, well, re- re- read the book first and just see for yourself. You know, mm. uh, I mean, you know, there there are other breathing systems. Another really good book is that breathology. Okay. Uh, I believe the guy's name is Stig Sevenson. He's a uh, free diver. Uh, he holds the world record for holding his breath underwater. Yeah, uh, it was something. Uh, was it like eleven? Oh, well over eleven minutes or something. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. amazing. <laughs> so he he has a kind of and that was a really interesting book too. It's more based on yogic breathing. And then uh, one of my martial arts teachers, the great uh, Hicks and Gracie, it's spelled like Ricks and Gracie. Yeah, guy was like a, a breathologist himself, man. He he would just wrestle and wrestle and wrestle and never get winded. He did a lot of yogic breathing techniques, and all his brothers, Hoist and Hoyler, you know, they all use this particular type of breathing when in uh, combat, and it can keep you really calm and keep you keep you from uh, panicking. Because as soon as you start to hold the breath, or gulp, or gasp, or, or, or make involuntary breath holds, uh, don't get me wrong. Now it's okay to do voluntary breath holds voluntarily especially if you're lifting uh like really heavy weight you know like a weight lifter mm-hmm. you have to you know do like a, a a voluntary breath hold like a max deadlift or something not that i do that kind of stuff but it's a useful tool uh for weight lifters or people doing extreme exertions but in 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 regular uh, high intensity strength training or in martial arts you don't want to be doing those those breath holds you want to keep yourself uh, really relaxed, and you want to you you want to keep that breath flowing the whole time. As soon as you start to hold the breath or ma- make those guttural noises, you start to get uh, all sorts of stress hormones, and you start to go to the upper chest. You start to uh, lose your your ability to control yourself. Uh, fine motor skills go right out the window. You get hyperadrenalized and so forth. Ah, interesting. Uh, it's uh, but, re- but, but read the book. I mean, it's worth worth, worth checking out. I mean, I, I don't make any money from telling people to read it, but I read it. Uh, it, it really jived with a lot of other things that I had heard from other sources, and uh, I, I started uh, doing a lot of the stuff. And then, of course, you know the the Russian breath masters with the uh, Sistema guys. Uh, I was incorporating a lot of that stuff in there, and but Yako and, and the Sistema guys pretty much were in agreement on a lot of points, and uh, I, I started incorporating it as uh, in my my own lifestyle, uh, and I I think uh, I, I've uh, received great benefit. Do you still care? Oh, sorry, do you still not care very much about EMFs? Last time we spoke, you weren't that bothered about electromagnetic fields affecting well, the body from like electronic it, devices. It's not much I can do about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's kind of like you you can you can worry about this stuff mm-hmm. and drive yourself crazy in mm-hmm. some ways, you know. I mean, I already do so much stuff as it is anyway, you know, preventative wise. Yeah. Uh, I guess maybe I, I, I should look into uh, investing in a shielding device of some type. Um, they, they make these shielding devices that supposedly protect you from these EMF. Okay. But, you know, what am I going to do? I got to fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, the, the only thing I really do um, is put my phone in an airplane mode, but it's in my pocket. That's really all I do. I just don't like the idea of uh, my phone potentially frying my testicles. So, <laughs> well, so good point, man. Do you do stuff? Do you do stuff like that? Where you stick your phone in airplane mode, like if it's on your person? Stuff like uh, that? Yeah, uh, a lot of times I'll carry my my phone in a little backpack. Yeah, away from me. Yeah, you know. But I never thought about that. But you know, it's funny because there was a friend of mine in Germany that actually gave me a little device that you actually attach to your phone. This supposedly uh, limits the uh, negative effect of the uh, electromagnetic fields from your phone. Right. Maybe I should go look for that again. I had it for a while. It was a little thing that just stuck right under the outside of the phone case. Yeah. A- and uh, yeah, damn, I should get that again. Well, Maybe try it again. I had a on my old iPhone. I had a. I think the case was from a company called Pong, uh, P O N G, I think, and they're not cheap. Um, but they they. 
protect they're supposed to uh they're supposed to protect the your body from the uh electromagnetic field that the phone then radiates is my understanding um it pushes it away from from you or from the phone or something like that so i wonder and if- there's there's other shielding devices that you can wear on your body around your neck right Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, actually, it might not be a bad idea because I am exposed quite a bit, you know, with the air travel. I mean, you're just in one huge electromagnetic field when you fly. Yeah. And then, like you said, you know, I'm on my iPad and use my iPhone quite a bit. So, yeah, I, I probably am exposed. Mm. Uh so yeah, good suggestion. I think I'll take you up on it. <laughs> well, I don't. I'm no. I'm no like you know. I'm not saying I practice any of this stuff that that much. I do the, the very bare minimum. Um, but I'm wondering whether it's worth looking into one of these cases for the. I, I have the iPhone Seven, um, so I may look into it for something like that. Um, so moving on to diet. So last time we were talking, we talked about your food combining diet strategy. Um, and since since we spoke last, I've got quite into this whole zero carb movement. Um, are you familiar with these guys that basically just eat meat, red meat, and practically? Yeah, uh, I actually uh, I actually read the original guy. Uh, maybe you never heard of him, Vil Vilmar Stephenson. Oh no, I have not. Oh. He wrote the Fat of the Land. He was a Arctic explorer who uh, the. I guess it was very early 1900s. He lived with the uh, uh, Inuit for eight years and northern Canadian Indians and uh, did a lecture at the Bellevue Hospital in New York City and and claimed that he had lived in an all-meat diet. He called it his Stone Age diet. He claimed for eight years nothing but meat, animal products, and that the only vegetable matter or plant matter he got was from the stomach contents of caribou that they would slaughter. The Indian wet had, uh, they would slice the stomach and dump the partially digested grasses into the cooking pot along with the meat and stew it. Uh-huh. And uh, the, a lot of the meat they ate was raw. And he claimed he never felt better, that uh, he lost body fat and that even his hair went from gray to dark. And he felt fantastic. And he noted that the the Eskimo people he was living with had perfect teeth and were very muscular, uh, robust people. Of course, relatively short lifespan. Much of that could be attributed to the fact that they just live in such harsh conditions. It's just, yeah. you know, the, the type of weather extremes would definitely take a toll on your body. And just really harsh physical lives, too, would have to take its toll over yeah. time. And they called him a liar. They said, no way you could eat just meat. We don't believe you. And they challenged him. So he put himself in metabolic, uh, uh, in a metabolic ward under lockdown. He stayed in there for a couple of weeks. And they only fed him uh, lamb and steak and so forth. And then they were able to take blood samples and stuff. And they released him from the ward. And then he had to submit to blood tests weekly. To, and, of course, the blood test would reveal whether he had been eating, slipping in those carbohydrates and grains and stuff. Sure. And uh, he did it for, um, I forget how many months. It's quite a while. Was it three months? Maybe six months. You can read about it, though, in The Fat of the Lamb. Anyway, he, he did this experiment and proved them wrong, that you could live very, very healthfully and stay lean and, and active and have all the energy you need just eating animal proteins and fats. Hmm. But, uh, you know, it is an extremist diet. And, uh, you know, people, paleo hunters that live this way didn't have particularly long lifespans. But I do believe you can live very uh, healthy on this type of diet. But that, that, that day is so skewed by, like, infant mortality and other factors like disease, which we don't have to deal with as much today. Oh, well, the other thing is, too, though, uh, the quality of the animals. Uh, if you're eating uh, farm animals, you may be getting very, very poor quality meat. True. So, you know, mm. th- that's going to be a big factor. And, of course, the, the ancient hunters, they did eat a lot of that meat raw, you know, the, the, or, or just barely cooked. You know, they, they would uh, – so it's interesting. Uh, it is. It's, it's something – so there's a guy on Twitter called uh, 
Sort of like the exact opposite of a vegan diet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the polar opposite. Um, but there's a... There's... But yeah, I, 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 I have tried it. Um, yeah. Because I do travel and I can't always uh, vouch for the quality of the animals, I found that uh, the food combining works pretty good. Uh, you know, eat a little bit of everything. Just don't mix it together in one meal. It just takes a real toll on your, your digestion when you overcrowd your nutrition. You know, and you're mixing all these different food stuffs in one meal. So much easier to digest because you know you can only utilize what you digest, right? And yeah. if uh, most people overburden the digestion from a overeating in the first place, but you see, overeating is encouraged when you do your typical American or European type diet, where you're just mixing carbohydrates and fats and proteins, and a lot of people will have dessert on top of that. Not to mention alcohol in the meal. Or whatever. So, by separating the f- the foods out and basing a a, a meal on, on basic fruits, maybe with some dairy or some nuts added to that if necessary, uh, a starch meal, uh, and then a protein meal with uh, uh, vegetables or starches and vegetables, and you'll find your digestion improves a lot, your elimination and so forth. But see, here's the thing. How do you know your diet's working for you? Well, because let's face it. Well, I mean, think about this. Uh, there's any number of diets that have proven themselves to be healthy. First of all, what are the oldest people in the world eating? The the people that you know, like in the blue zones, you've heard of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, they're not eating all meat, <laughs> right? That's yeah. one thing, yeah. but uh, but but you know we could go around the world showing indigenous people uh, extremely healthy with very very diet. Just re- read Western Price's work. Mm-hmm. Maybe you've heard of this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where I have a little bit of an issue with the Blue Zone stuff, though, is that a lot of these people, yes, they're living long, but they're not always that physically capable. Is well, that- it's really funny because we go to Icaria, Greece, where they have the uh, supposedly the most centenarians. Uh-huh. People live longer than anywhere else. But we were looking at some of the people. I said, Jesus Christ, I'd rather be dead. Right. There's <laughs> lifespan and there's health span, right? It, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. You're 100% right about that. Yeah. But let's look at, is your diet working for you? The number one thing, are you fat? Mm-hmm. If you're overweight? Your diet's not working for you. Are you sick a lot? Do you get colds or flu or fever? You know, if you if you catch in uh, uh, colds all the time, obviously your immune system's impaired. As a, uh, you, you can start to point your finger at your diet. Could be sleep, could be stress, but I'm I'm, I'm betting that the diet's playing a big part. Do you have a stuffy nose? That's a good sign that you're having uh, uh, allergy or food sensitivity problems. Your diet's probably not working for you. Do you have uh, problems with your skin? Do you have pimples? You know, do you have pustules? Uh, you know, that type of stuff. Or do you have uh, uh, skin problems of any type, even dry skin? You may want to look hard at the diet. Now, no one of these things is going to be, you know, uh, the culprit, but it could be. Uh do you move your bowels a couple times a day? If, if you're constipated, you better look at that diet. Or the other thing, some people just have extremely loose bowels, almost like diarrhea. Your diet's probably not working for you. Do you have good muscle tone? Do you have plenty of energy to get up and work out? If not, your diet's probably not working for you. Do you have to rely on coffee and, and, and stimulants to goad your body? Eh, your diet's probably not working for you. You know, if you look at an, if you, if you would buy an animal, well, oh, teeth and gums. Do you have dental caries? Do you have bleeding gums? If you do, your diet's not working for you. If you're going to the dentist and getting your teeth filled and drilled all the time, dude, you better take a hard look at what you're doing with your diet. Yeah. Like I say, no one of the symptoms necessarily, but when you look at the whole picture, you know, your skin, your bowels, you know, your eyes, ears, whether it's working, your muscle tone, your energy levels, uh, your elimination process, you know, are you fat or not? That's how you tell the diet's working. And mm. there's any number of diets that would work for, for people that they could say yes to all those questions. Yes, it's all good. Yeah, very true. Yeah. Just just on the, the, the body fat side of things, what would be 
I guess for man and woman, what would be considered over fat in your opinion? Well, I had an old wrestling, uh, <laughs> you take a skin fold on your, on your tummy and uh-huh. you compare it to the skin fold in your cheek should be about the same. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting litmus <laughs> test. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty easy, right? Yeah. Right. But, uh, basically if you can see your abdominals in the mirror, Clearly, clearly defined animal uh, abdominals. You're doing pretty good. Yeah, you know, you're, so, you're ten. Yeah, when you when you can see your abs, you're about ten percent. Yeah. So I I'm not talking about like Men's Health magazine, you know, like yeah. a fitness model. But I mean, if you can see the outline of your abs, you're doing great. You're 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 fine. No need to be any leaner. Well, here's the not thing. for health purposes. Here's the thing. So I, I since being exposed to this kind of zero carb movement, and I've been following Dr. Sean Baker's work, who's also been a guest on the podcast. Um, and he's this guy. Have you heard of him, Dr. Sean Baker? Have you seen him? No, Twitter? but one of my early mentors was Dr. Gregory Ellis, who was like one of the foremost pioneers with the uh, uh, low carb, zero carb. Right. Movement. Okay. Okay. But this, uh, this... Ellis El- 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 was very, very much into the. Uh, uh, the the uh, oh the uh, glycated glycation theory of aging right yeah the, yeah yeah you know where the the carbohydrates will and protein molecules will form a, a sticky glycated protein and really gum up the works and uh, be you know create a whole cascade of uh, negative aging things going on in the body yeah but but in any case like I. I had Sean on the podcast a couple of times. Um, and he's, uh, you know, he's 50, 50, 51. He's a incredible athlete, looks amazing and is doing an all meat diet. And he's kind of partly, you know, he's taking kind of a leadership role in the zero carb community and doing some, uh, doing some big experiments. And I, I started embracing this way of eating when I moved to Ireland because it was just more convenient for me. So I was eating, sure. I, rather than eating three meals a day, I switched to two meals a day. So I was basically doing intermittent fasting till lunch. Um, and my diet is so simple. It's ridiculous. And it did make me think, Oh, I'm, I'm sort of com- food combining a bit like Steve Maxwell. Um, and you know, my, my lunch might be, it's typically steak and eggs. And my dinner is typically, well, it's not, it's not, it's not quite food combining. It's normally a steak and maybe a white potato or vegetables. Um, but I'm pretty much eating steak, you know, two to three times a day. And what happened? I got absolutely ripped doing this. And I know my audience is going to be sick of hearing this because I've been talking about this a fair bit on the podcast, but I do wonder because I got, I mean, I, I got effortlessly really shredded, like eight pack lean. And I feel like I, you know, Going going back to what you were saying about all those markers of health and whether your diet's working, I could tell you that all of, I met all of that criteria. So I wasn't. Oh, there you go. I wasn't afraid that I was too lean. I feel like, well, I'm an ectomorph, so maybe I'm supposed to be leaner than your average. Do you think that's a fair, a fair kind well, of like? Yeah, I mean, let's let's put it this way: uh, in modern society, lean people are the rarity. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you know, uh, already you're you know you're 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 way on the other side of normal, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, uh, I felt really good when I did it. Mm. Uh, it's just a little bit more convenient for me to uh, to have some carbohydrates. I seem to tolerate them quite well. Same. But yeah. my carbohydrates are coming from fruits and vegetables primarily. Yeah. I don't really eat a lot of grain. If I do, I'll only have it by itself with nothing else just to facilitate the digestion. And it doesn't seem to hurt me at all. Right. You know, and, you know, I, I, I have a clearly delineated six pack and feel very good. I meet all of the same parameters. Uh, one thing you might want to look for is, uh, uh, your joint health and arthritis. Some people claim that the, uh, the high meat, uh, I, I I don't know whether you've you've noticed or not uh, mm. any kind of uh, okay, but no, go on. Yeah, so just, some people claim that, do they? Yeah, some people claim that, okay. but just look at it. You know, just look at it for yourself. Uh, I I personally uh, thrived on that, but it, it's a it's it's for me it was a hard diet to do on the road. It really is. I can imagine. I it's, know, it's, it's, finding good meat and, and and good products like that is really tough, man. Yeah, cool. Now, nothing I would want to eat. I don't feel like 
you know, McDonald's burgers or, you know, <laughs> Burger King or whatever, you know, God knows what, you, <laughs> what you're, what, what you're taking in. That's a, that's a fair point. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really revolutionary for me because it's very simple. I don't really think about it. I just buy loads of meat in bulk. So it's, 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 a, it's a real kind of nice, elegant way of approaching diet for me. Um, so yeah, so far so good. But last week I was on the, uh, I had to travel, uh, for kind of a, a bit of a family emergency. And as a result, and I guess with the stress, you know, I did, I did fall off the wagon a little bit and, Jesus, do I feel it? You know, like when I came back to my normal routine, I'm sort of, I have some very minor, you know, stuffiness in my nose and these little symptoms come up for me as soon as I deviate off, you know, what I know are healthy practices for me. Otherwise, like you, I, I experience very little sickness or pain or anything like that. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah, well, so your diet's working for you. Yeah. And I, I could I could pretty much say, just say the same thing. If anyone should be sick, it would be me. I'm, I'm, you know, if germs were indeed the cause of illness, man, am I exposed. Yeah. I mean, there's filthy, there's filthy air, airplane bathrooms and, sit, you know, air, air, airlines are just full of, uh, you know, filth and, 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 and germs and so forth. Yet my immune system is very strong. So obviously – what I'm doing is working for me. My, as long as your immune system's strong, your diet's working for you. Yeah. But, you know, I, I eat things like quinoa, for example, or uh, I like uh, chia seeds and, and nuts. You know, like, uh, for example, yesterday breakfast was uh, uh, a bowl of cherries and chia seed pudding. Very nice. Uh, it was just, yeah, it was delicious, you know, with a little almond milk in there to soak up the chia seeds, give it a little flavor. Uh, there were some uh, almonds in there. So, you know, I, I will eat plant-based type foods, but I certainly have nothing against diving into a lamb shanks or a uh, steak. Or, uh, uh, well, the other day my lunch was uh, a dozen fried eggs. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, with a large raw vegetable salad. I, I like the... Uh, you know, I like to get those uh, enzymes from the raw fruits and the vegetables and the cell salts from the fruits and the vegetables. But, you know, uh, last night, a large raw vegetable salad, leafy greens with cucumbers and a little radish and onions and uh, some cherry tomatoes with a little drizzle of dressing. And I ate a half a chicken, a little bit more. It was a whole chicken, but I ate. Uh, both legs and half the breast and one of the wings and ate the bones included. So, you know, I'll do stuff like that. How'd you eat the bones? What do you mean? I just, you know, the, I, you know, I just chew the ends off the bones and chew up the cartilage and uh, oh. the soft ends of the bone su and suck the marrow out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I so, you know, I, uh, but, you know, once again, two meals also. Two meals. So I'm pretty yeah. much down to two meals. I do believe the systematic underfeeding is really good, oh, giving yeah. yourself plenty of time between meals. I mean, I've read – listen, I'm no nutrition expert. I'm no doctor. I don't have a PhD in biochemistry or that stuff. But oh, wow. I read the guys that do. Yeah, I read constantly. I love Alan Aragon's newsletter. He's a big debunker. Uh, you know, I've, I've looked at the works of so many different guys. And people just have to come to grips with what they can live with. The best diet is the one that you can live with. True. You know, yeah. I mean, if you try an all meat diet and you just can't deal with it, well, it's not going to work for you, you know? Yeah, totally. I, I totally agree. And, you know, if, if someone asked me for my advice on a fat loss diet, um, or, or they want to lose a lot of body fat, I don't think I would recommend this because I think I under, estimate how much discipline it requires to get here and that maybe some people can get to this point and maybe this is a progression but i sometimes think there are other ways of eating that are far more sustainable well the, like i said there's there's many uh healthy indigenous people around the world mm. and with varied diets you know they're strong they're healthy they're lean they're plenty of energy you know you know you look at the okinawans who are the oldest uh, group, oldest living group, and but a lot of them are actually pretty spry, well into advanced age. I've seen Chinese Qigong masters in their nineties that live predominantly in race-based diets. Dude, they move like a child. 
even in their 80s and 90s. I, I, one, of my, uh, one of my friends sent me a video the other day of this 81-year-old uh, doing these forms. Guy was lean. He was wiry. He was incredibly mobile. And you know that the guy's pounding the rice, man. Right? Interesting. So it just goes to show that there's not just one way. Mm. There's multiple ways. But you, every person out there listening has to find their way. Yeah, good point. You know? It's yeah, it's very easy to get uh, pulled into a dogma and, um, yeah, very, very important to stay, to stay open-minded. But I understand where you're coming from because, you know, you've kind of recently discovered this little carb thing and it's really working for it. (laughs) And, you know, you're, you're lean as a racehorse. You're looking good. You're feeling good. So why wouldn't you be enthusiastic about it? Of course. And we're always going to try to encourage people to try things that are working for us. Sure. Especially, you know, if you care about people and you want to help your fellow man, give them a little leg up. So you're always going to tout the things that seem to be working for you. Mm-hmm. Maybe it'll work for them too. But I guess my point is that there's a lot of things that work. Just like Drew was talking mm-hmm. about strength training, every program by the time you've been doing it for what, three years, is going to give you about the same results. So now it just comes down to safety and sustainability and how much time are you willing to put into it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because I mean, when it comes down to the end, uh, everything kind of ends up in the same place anyway <laughs> totally yeah they all end up to the same the same destination don't they <laughs> all these different programs the only problem is some of them can really create some real serious damage to your body if you're not careful yeah. and i i experienced that you know when i got heavily into that kettlebell thing that was <laughs> definitely uh misstep on my part <laughs> um this is a that's a neat segue into training as we had a few questions from listeners um what is the most of this is a this chap actually commented on the post you shared and my own and he asked what what is the most effective and efficient way you found to increase strict pull-up repetitions or suppose you could substitute that for form and um, without overuse problems well see Here's the problem. Why do you care about how many repetitions you do? Guys get so hung up in this, you know, repetitions. Yeah. Obviously, you can do a lot more fast, sloppy, crappy reps. But what does it all mean? You know, okay, you want to improve strict reps. But remember when Ryan Hall was talking about, like, like you have a certain threshold, you know, like a certain time under load threshold? Mm Mm-hmm. I found that I have that threshold. It doesn't matter whether they go fast, slow, one rep. You know, like the remember the old one rep uh, uh, pull up. Yeah. Like the, yeah, like uh, like sixty, uh, thirty, thirty, or sixty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god! But it always ends up that my time under load is pretty much the same no matter what. Okay. So you know, in, in trying to achieve a high number of pull ups, in order to do it you're going to have to go faster and faster within whatever your, your, your time under load parameter is. And that's when you start running into joint problems. It's a real sign of maturity when you just don't give a fuck anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't care, man. It doesn't matter. Mm. Who cares how many reps you could do? I, I completely, like, completely agree. You know, like, yeah. like, you know, anyone in the high intensity training will tell you it's more important how you do those reps as to how many. And I'll, I'll just add to that as I think, I think you're right. It's uh, their question is uh, the goal is quite arbitrary. Um, it's very arbitrary. You know, okay. If you're a law enforcement yeah. guy and you have to do a test to make the SWAT team or you're in the military and, you know, they test you on this stuff. All right. You're going to have to kind of loosen the form a little bit. And, you know, there, there are tried, true, proven methods to improving your ability to do repetition exercises for example uh pavel said solian has the fighter pull-up program that's a pretty good one uh there's another grease the groove technique where you just do some maximal sets throughout the day he can look these up online uh another one is the pull-up ladder which is another form of grease the groove where you're treating the exercise as kind of a skill and and i have to admit it is kind of fun i i i uh, i used to enjoy you know, screwing around with this stuff myself, where you do like uh, one rep and rest and two and three. So you're doing a whole bunch of sub max reps. Yeah. And then when you get to, let's say, five or six and you start to struggle, 
you go back to one again with lots of rest in between the reps. And you're treating the, the exercise as a skill because you're, you're trying to improve your skill of doing the pull up. Why would you want to? Eh, because maybe you're being tested in it. Maybe True. you're being judged and you're pulling because, you know, you're going to the, you know, you want to go through Army Ranger School or Army Airborne School or British SAS training where you're expected or required to get a certain number of push-ups or pull-ups. In that case, it might be a legitimate uh, question to improve your pull-up numbers. But there's plenty of websites out there, you know, militaryfitness.com. Uh, this guy, Stuart Smith, that wrote a whole – he was a former Navy SEAL. Uh, he's a specialist in uh, getting people through uh, the various uh, uh, military and law enforcement schools. He has special programs that you can go prepare yourself for just to get yourself ready. So, you know, I, I myself just don't care. <laughs> it just doesn't matter to me. Interesting. Uh, I think – sorry, go on. Yeah. But, well, Drew really got me back uh, into the isometric thing, you know. Uh, I, I I did isometrics back in the 60s as a kid. And, uh, of course, I was a huge Bruce Lee fan. And Bruce was really into the into the uh, the isometrics, too. And uh, so I used to do them as a young wrestler when I was in high school uh, with great success. And then the time static contraction protocol, wow, that just blew my mind. I says, wow, this is really fantastic stuff. So I'll, I'll do yielding uh, isometrics with my body weight, just pulling to the top of the bar and just holding as long as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. you know? Sometimes I'll do it from the bottom where I'll just pull myself a third of the way up because it seems like in doing pull-ups, people either struggle with getting their head over the bar that last couple inches or they have trouble getting started. Usually I find women have trouble – activating the lats and getting that first couple inches mm -hmm. and i find a lot of guys have trouble finishing the movement but you know and, and some people have trouble with both yeah. but you can do isometrics in either end you can you can just hang and and pull yourself a third of the way up and and, and continue to do a yielding isometric that way or you can pull yourself the whole way up to the top do yielding isometric with your head up over the bar. It's just not Either as sexy way. as full range of motion. Though. Nah, it's not sexy at all, man. It's <laughs> it's it's it's, it's, uh, well, it's definitely convenient not. if you haven't got the. Oh, incredibly tools. convenient. Yeah, like in hotels, sometimes there's no pull up bars or anything. I'll just uh, put a washcloth or a towel on the top of the door and grip over the door and pull myself so my head's over the door. A lot of times, my head will be against the ceiling, so that's a good way of telling whether I'm slipping or not. And as soon as I start to lose contact with the ceiling and come down, then I'll just stop the, uh, I'll, I'll glance at my timer and just see at what point I reach that momentary failure where I can no longer hold the position and try to beat it each time. Uh, usually for something like that, you're not going to get, you're not going to get the full time static contraction time under low. You'll be lucky if you get a minute. <laughs> it's hard, man. It's really hard. No, it is. It is. And um, I think also just to go back to that, uh, that person's question, and sorry, I forget your name. Um, I think it's really important to kind of underscore that it might not sound sexy, but reps are quite often just a kind of vanity metric. And the real goal, as I'm sure you'd agree, Steve, is fatigue and musculature safely. Um, Correct. And, well, I'll give an example. Just yeah. in London, not too long ago, I went into a uh, a uh, a gym where a young man jumped up and knocked off 22 pull-ups. I actually counted them. Yeah. But man, he was going fast, like a second up, second down. He wasn't he wasn't quite kipping, but he was kind of jerking at the bottom and using a little momentum to get in the next one without kipping. But still, it's impressive, right? Yeah. 22 pull-ups is still good, and. Uh, Pretty pretty jacked up muscular guy. So I had my guy jump up there who was a very, very strong young guy. And we did four seconds up, a two-second pause, squeeze at the top, four seconds down. And he managed six reps, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah. That's, is. that's a lot of reps. Yeah. He, he failed right at the sixth rep. So the guy that did the 22 had a time under load of about 44 or 45 seconds, whereas my guy had over a minute time under load. So it had a much, much more effective workout. Absolutely. Much more effective workout and a lot safer, a lot easier on his joints, much more sustainable. You know, so, you know, 
But yeah, the only, the only people who should be worried about reps are police and uh, military guys. You know, the, when you're being tested as a regular basis. Mm. Otherwise, it just doesn't matter. Who cares? Which is an arbitrary test in itself, unfortunately. Very arbitrary. You know, <laughs> but then they, I understand why they did it. You know, you have a group of like you know hundreds, if not thousands, of guys, and you got to have some kind of standard to weed them out. Yeah. But yeah. it's really amazing to me that pretty much the rep was never standardized. No one ever thought about Tom under a load. Mm. And, you know, uh, you know, like t- telling people to do an arbitrary, uh, arbitrary number of sets and reps without any, without paying attention to Tom under load is kind of mind blowing. It is. You know? I completely agree. I, they, they ne- I mean, the rep should have always been standardized. Yeah. I mean, and, and I'm saying that like super slow where it has to be like, you know, like 10 second reps or something. But at least for yourself, so you can compare one workout to another, you should have some kind of standardization. But, you know, I do like this idea of just measuring time under load. Don't even worry about the reps. Don't get too hung up in timing and using metronomes and all that stuff. Just, I, I usually go by breaths myself. Well, uh, you know. I'll um... do two, two or three re- uh, breaths to the positive, two or three to the negative. And uh, I find that works out pretty good. It ends up being just about four or five second uh, reps mm. but when you use the uh, breath. Is uh, and, and the breath is uh, is kind of like uh, I don't know whether you can hear me. Is it? I can hear. You. <laughs> yeah. Nasal in, mm. mouth out. Okay. And so so I, I'll go by breaths for my rep speed sometimes, and I like to vary that. But it's always time under load. Do you track your when you measure time under load? Do you track that? Do you write that down? Do you try and improve that next time, or are you beyond that? Nah, uh, I'm too. You know, I'm. I'm uh, I hate to use the word too old, but I'm not going to make any changes. It's not going to change. Sure. But I do. I do look at it. I mean, I could pretty much just tell you what my time under loads are. They're pretty much the same. Because w- once you're over your mid forties, your days for PRs are over, my friend. You're not going to see any more PRs. You're not going to gain any more muscle. What you see in the mirror is what you get, pretty much. The only the only exception would be a guy that started really late. You can always make progress at any age. Yeah. Or a guy that had trained early in life, had quit for a number of years and restarted again. You'll see progress. You know, if if you get sick or injured or you know due to work or something you would quit training you you will make progress when you first start but if you've been training regularly as long as i have i started like when i was 10 uh you're done man and that's very disappointing to people and and, and they find it non-motivating you know they'll, they'll, they'll say oh man you know uh no more prs you know uh, chasing the reps or chasing the weight you know, it's going to get, if, if that's what motivates you, then you probably will quit. You'll be really disappointed with your workouts because, you know, by the time you reach 65, like myself, man, you, you're not going to be able to handle the same kind of weights that you did when you were 25 or 35. You just, you, you just can't. But see, for me, training isn't about motivation. It's about discipline. Mm-hmm. I do it because I know I should. And I, I, I do it because I know it's good for me, just like the other health regimens that I do. You know, I don't particularly like flossing my teeth and oil switching for 20 minutes, but I know it's damn good for me. And I know that the, the ramifications of not doing it, uh, I'm not willing to pay that price. So for me, the training is a discipline. Now, do I enjoy it? Yeah, I, I like the exertion. I like the, 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 uh, the good feelings that, come from a from a from a good workout you know doing it is never a whole lot of fun sometimes but i i i I do kind of enjoy the challenge of of trying to maintain a certain level at any age Mm -hmm. and trying to hold on to it as long as i can so so you know people people have to realize that if if they're basing their workout motivation on extrinsic factors like number of reps amount of weight or mechanical work being done, they're going to be in for a big disappointment because that stuff is going to go down, man. I don't care who you are. You can't sustain that. All of my, I, I guess you could say motivation, although, like I said, is more of a discipline, but it's all intrinsic. It's all about the perfect rep. 
It's all about perfect focus. It's all about, you know, focusing on the breath. It's the discipline of the body. I, I, I guess I could, I could, I could say, uh, I, I get joy out of, of, of the discipline nature of the whole thing. Of, of the practice. And my practice is almost like Zen-like because it requires tremendous concentration. I almost go into a meditative state, really, when I do it. I shut out everything. The damn building could be on fire and I'd just be like very internally focused on the, on the, uh, on, on what I'm doing at that moment. Pretty much be here now. You know, n- never any music, any distractions I completely shut out. You know, I usually like to go outside and train in nature. I'll find a pull-up bar. That's all you really need. And to use my body weight. And uh, I really enjoy this kind of workouts. And uh, Drew turned me on to an awesome uh, 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 piece of equipment called the forearm forklift. Have you heard of this thing? I have, but I don't know what it is. I've heard the name. Uh, it's, it's basically a orange strap, a bright orange strap, used for mo- moving furniture. It has... Three loops on one end sewn in. They're padded loops for inserting your forearms uh-huh. so that you can insert the strap underneath. Let's say we want to move a couch together, you and I. So I'll put my strap under the couch, put my forearms in it, and do like a zercher lift. You know what I mean by zercher uh-huh. lift? Yeah. You know, lift it with my forearms, and you and I could walk the couch out of the house. It's a way of moving heavy furniture with less strain on your, your back. But it's perfect for isometrics. I was using my jiu-jitsu belt before, but, man, this thing's even better. So I'll take my four-on forklifts, and I fill in the gaps. Usually my, my big three are push-ups, uh, chin-ups or pull-ups, and squats. Sometimes one-legged squats, sometimes that. And then I fill in the gaps with lateral raises, uh, deadlifts, uh, neck work, and all that with the four-on forklift strap. This sorry, this forearm forklift strap is that the same one you use in the video for London Rail, the orange red thing? That's the, it. Oh, that's that's, it. that's excellent. I was going to ask you what brand that was because that is an amazing piece of kit for bodyweight. It training. really is. Do you know what the so, brand is? Because I'll get it uh, myself. Yeah, forearm forklift. Oh, I see. That's, that is that, the... yeah. If you go on Amazon, you could just have it delivered tonight. As a matter of fact, cool. I when I was in Germany, we went on. Uh, Amazon EU, and it came like the next day in the mail. It was delivered right to the hotel. I got two. It comes in pairs. I gave one to my mate. I showed him how to use it. And, uh, yeah, it was really awesome. Uh, I actually have two clients. Uh, They're Indians. Their parents own the largest textile manufacturing uh, company in India. They make clothes like for Uniqlo. So they're big time, right? So both of them are doing high intensity uh, body weight training mixed in with time study contractions. So I get, I I, I uh, showed the forearm forklift to the one young gentleman and said, "Hey, could you guys make this? Make me one with more loops, a little bit longer, with maybe two more loops in it." Uh-huh. I'm just curious to see what he's going to come up with. Oh wow! <laughs> so you, maybe maybe you want to. Uh, if, if it turns out, I'll turn you on to these guys because I don't want to go into business of selling stuff. I just want it for my own my own kit. So they're going to make me a little custom forearm forklips type yeah. strap with the loops. But my God, it is fantastic! You know, you can do like old school lateral raise. Uh, yeah. You you can uh, use it for shrugs. Uh, Man, it's so great for the uh, time static contraction squat. You just slip your feet in the loops. Uh, my jiu-jitsu about work, but sometimes it would slip from underneath your heel a little bit okay. or dig into your heel. Uh, it's fantastic for the um, – did you see Brian do that little hip thrust, like the little yeah, shoulder bridge? Yeah, the, the hip, hip raise or hip thrust, whatever you want to call it. That thing is yeah. a glute fryer, man. Boy, you you will fill your ass cheeks like you've never felt them before, and um, it's hard to do that with a belt. But man, the forearm forklift strap with his little loops—you just cross it around the waist and turn it over. Wow, man, unbelievable, awesome. fantastic piece of kit. So there's virtually nothing you can't do. Why why do you think a lot of or several high intensity training trainers are out of shape? Well, well, diet for one thing. They're, you know, they, they 
a, a lot a lot of high high intensity guys they're under the opinion that that's all that matters and they just basically sit around a lot mm-hmm. and they don't do much else and even ken hutchins used to poo poo walking and anything to do with aerobics for whatever reason he had a real hate on with uh, aerobic training um I, i'm not an advocate of aerobic training per se but i am a real advocate of just getting up and moving your ass you know and i i believe that the overeating is stimulated by sitting around just out of boredom you know when you're not moving around you're not eating right yeah oh now we we know that exercise is not a good way to 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 uh get rid of body fat i mean it's very poor you know you, you just don't burn enough calories but as long when you're active though you're not eating <laughs> Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. If you're out playing with the kids or playing basketball or going out in the jiu-jitsu mat or you're walking or you're hiking or you're out in nature, you're not sitting around eating. And it's just too damn easy when you're sitting around. You just get bored, man. If you're on the iPad or the computer or whatever, you just get bored. It's And, you know, you, uh, you, you just start thinking about food all the time. You become preoccupied with it. And it does help the calorie equation to to a bit, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I make sure I get at least ten thousand steps a day. Sometimes, you know, I'll get twenty thousand in a day. Just, I just find that just moving my body around just feels good, and sitting around feels horrible. And I also find that sitting just crushes your mobility and just gives you horrible posture, forward head, kyphosis. And there's no amount of high intensity strength training that's going to to uh, balance that out. As good as it is, it's just not enough. You, uh, you, you still got to get up and move. You got to be active. I really believe that. And I think that's a big mistake that the high intensity community made in encouraging people that all they need is two 20 minute workouts a week. Maybe for strength, but man, you'll, you'll, you'll lose a lot of your, your, your other ability to, to, uh, to move. I've seen it. I've had these guys come in. You know, to jujitsu classes and so forth, you know, wanting to, to learn and horrible motor skills and coordination just from setting. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. There's a few more questions and then I will start to wrap up, Steve. Um, seeing that sleep is the great healer and bringer of gains, <laughs> um, what damage control should the night shift workers among us implement? Oh, that's a tough one. I, you know, I had the experience of working at night myself when I was in college. Uh, I worked my way through school. You know, when I graduated from university, I didn't have any bills. I paid off everything in cash, pretty much. I had saved for years from the time I was 12 till I entered as a freshman. And then I worked the whole way through to pay, pay my, off my education. And one of the jobs I had was working at an ice cream factory in Philadelphia at Abbott's Dairies, loading ice cream trucks in a freezer all night long, all summer. It was so cold. We used to, if you spit, it would freeze before it hit the floor. That's how <laughs> damn cold this freezer wow. was. It was like, like working in the Arctic. So it could, it could be like a hot July day outside, like brutal hot. And you go in that freezer and you come out and you'd be shivering for like half an hour and you worked in shifts and working nighttime like that. I never felt like I could get enough sleep. It was just awful. You know, when you are going against the law of nature, basically, you know, staying up all night. But one of the things I found was that if when I came home, I would do my training then and then go to bed. It was way better than if I would go to bed and then get up and try to train before going to work. Right. I would work the whole shift all night, come home. It would be the morning. I would do my workout. Then I would go to bed and sleep right up almost to the point where I would go back into work. That seemed to work out way better for me because I tried it both ways. They may want to experiment that way. Hmm. They may want to try it and just see if working out after the shift before going to bed doesn't work out better for them than trying to go home, go to sleep and then get up and train. Now that's some good advice. Um, Oh, by the way, blackout shades, earplugs, mm-hmm. uh, even an eye mask and cover all led lights in the room. 
can really help with your sleep during the day. The blackout shades help a lot. If that's not possible, uh, eye mask, uh, some some type of earplug to shut out the noise and uh, cover up any kind of little LED lights and stuff. Make your room as dark and cool as possible. If it's summertime, blast the air conditioner, and that will really help the sleep during the day. I, I do it at night, too, but it really, when you're a daytime sleeper, um, you, you got to make the environment really, really quiet. Right. Optimize the environment. Um, what are your tips for dealing with elbow tendonitis and tendonitis in general? Well, first of all, it's an overuse injury generally or from mm-hmm. overgripping. So you have to look at the source, what's causing it. It could be dietary inflammation, you know, just eating a lot of inflammatory foods, you know. I, I was saying to you before, some people have indicted uh, heavy protein, heavy meat eating with that. Mm. Uh, that's something you might want to take a look at. But one of the things that really helps with the grip is I, I, I put a rubber band around my fingers. And I do the exact opposite of gripping. And I open the fingers out. Uh, jiu-jitsu players and judo players have uh, a real tendency for this type of elbow uh, problem from over gripping the gi all the time. Uh, rock climbers too. It was a rock climber that actually taught this exercise to me. It works like a charm. You just open your fingers and extend your wrist back. So you abduct and extend the fingers and the wrist at the same time uh, repeatedly with the rubber band, time under load. And, you know, try to get it like a, a minute and a half time under load. And it really burns the, the top of your forearm. It, it's just like magic. A lot of the problems with the elbow just go away. Unbelievable. You have to try to believe it. Mm, It really, really works. A lot of times also it could be muscle imbalance. I recommend doing uh, also reverse uh, wrist curls to work the top of the forearms because, you know, think about how much we grip, grip, grip. Yeah. And, you know, you're, you're always flexing your wrist, but are you ever extending your wrist? So it could, it could be just either overuse or uh, muscle imbalance or a combination of those. But by doing the finger extensions and extending the wrist, it really helps. It's it's helped for hundreds of jiu-jitsu guys I've worked with in, in the past. It's certainly uh, worth a try for, for the people that are suffering from it. So if you've got it in the elbow, if it is a muscle imbalance, then the wrist, applying those, measure, those, those interventions to the wrist could be helpful. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. It's it's helped me and like I say, hundreds of others. Uh, for me, uh, after about maybe the fifth or sixth time I did the rubber band thing, boom, it just went away. Mm. It was like wow. And then I was very careful with my uh, chins or pull downs uh, about the gripping. They might even want to just go off all that pulling stuff for a while and just do time static contraction uh, pullover exercise or even just get a pullover torso type machine and just work single joint stuff just for just for a while just to let it kind of ease up a little bit do time static contraction bicep but don't grip it put the the resistance on the wrist as opposed to the hand mm. especially if it's overuse related yeah that's some, that's some good advice um, so many questions here, but I just want to be, I want to be, uh, respectful of your time. And I think the girlfriend's going to turn up soon. So I've got to be respectful of hers. Um, what, uh, I'm just very interested because I think last time we, we spoke a lot about, uh, your lifestyle, the travel, all of that stuff. Um, what do you do for fun? Like, you know, if you just, just to look at like a typical day in the life of Steve Maxwell, can you walk us through like a typical day and then what you do for fun, I suppose, in the, like for relaxation in the evenings and stuff like that? Well, it varies depending on the place that I'm at. Like I just came from Vancouver, British Columbia, absolutely beautiful, fantastic parks. I don't know whether you've ever been in the Pacific Northwest, but my God, it's just lovely, especially this time of year. And, you know, I do my little morning routine, you know, my, you know, all the, all the stuff. And then, uh, I'll have my coffee, answer a few emails. And then I was going out and walking around this gorgeous park outside, breathing in the fresh air, uh, doing various, uh, uh, bre- breathing exercises that I've been taught by my Sistema breath masters, uh, also some yogi type breath work. Then I would stop and, uh, do some basic joint mobility 
type work. To me, that's great fun. Really feels good. Other days ago, there was uh, a really nice little uh, parkour where they had uh, pull-up bars and so forth. And I would just do my little strength training routine outside. For me, that's great fun. Uh, another day, I would just go out and take a nice little zen run. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the rest of the day, uh, I'll answer my emails. Uh, I do online personal training. I, I get great joy in that. get a lot of personal satisfaction in, uh, you know, overlooking my supervising my clients' workout programs and, uh, you know, helping them with uh, diet programs and so forth, diet logs. And uh, I, I, uh, I do like to watch uh, movies and TV shows on my iPad. I find that enjoyable. Um Recently, uh, my girlfriend's studying Russian, and so we've been wa- watching a, ru- a lot of Russian TV and movies with subtitles, <laughs> so she she can get you know. But they're really cool. Uh, I, I like the Russian sense of humor, and uh, I like their style. So I, I, I guess I've become a, a bit of a, uh, a Slavophile with the Slavic Russian. Uh, so we listen to the, a lot of those kind of things, but uh, yeah. That's that's pretty much a day. It's pretty pretty easy going. Uh, I really enjoy teaching. Uh, today here in Arizona, uh, first day, I'm going to go roll with a young guy. He's a young young guy that runs a jujitsu school. I'm going to go in. We're going to do a little uh, little sparring, play around a little bit, see how. Hope, hopefully, he won't hurt the old guy here. <laughs> I'll, I'll show him, show him some old man tricks and. Uh, there's some specific uh, mobility uh, drills I want to show this guy to keep his body spry, so he 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 can still continue to do uh, do the thing he loved well into advanced age. You know, mm-hmm. jujitsu is a very sustainable martial art. It's something you can do well into advanced age. Now, that's very interesting, and I yeah I can I like I I very much. I'm inspired by your lifestyle um, and try to take elements of that because i know i'm similar to you i like to be moving as much as possible i don't like to be sat down for long periods of time so it's, it's very inspiring to hear that um i was wondering would you ever be open to doing a seminar or work, one of your workshops in galway if i were to host it oh hell, hell yeah uh, <laughs> i'm there man let's do it just write uh, the website. Teresa is keep uh, keeps the schedule for me. Cool. I mean, I she, she's very organized. Uh, I am not. Uh, I guess I could be if I had to, but you know, she she is really good with that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, write 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 her and tell her that uh, you'd like to do, do a corporate warrior uh, seminar. Yeah, no, I'd love to. It'd be uh, yeah, it'd be great. Well, what? what um, so this is an island you're on, Galway. Yeah, Galway is like the west coast of Ireland. Okay, um, is it a, near Belfast? No, that's the other side. <laughs> other side. Okay, but yeah, um, no, my my geography is a little. I, I don't expect you to know that, but um, it's uh, a very it up on the map. Yeah, yeah, it's a very lovely city. Lots of culture, uh, lots of different people, and very lively, especially during the summer. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, I will drop I'll drop her a note. And uh, we'll get the ball rolling. Uh, but that'd be Let's great do it. Too. It'll be fun. We'll have a lot of fun. And you're in Northern Ireland anyway next May, aren't you? I had a look at your schedule. Yeah, I'm actually working with a guy in Belfast. Uh, he yeah. owns uh, traditional Japanese uh, jiu-jitsu schools there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he was starting to suffer a lot from uh, immobility and okay. joint issues and so forth. So I got him on a good uh, uh, food combining diet. And got him off all the rubbish. He was eating like six times a day. Jeez. And uh, got this guy on a high-intensity training protocols, uh, mixing body weight exercise with some bar- barbell and time static contraction, like a little little mix. And uh, he's been uh, unbelievable results. This guy looks like a kid. Oh, that's he awesome. shed so much body fat. I, bet. I mean, it looks good. He feels feels good. Uh, so I've been working with him, and I do seminars at his school sometimes there in Belfast. So I'm there quite a bit. Awesome. Steve, what's the best way for people to contact you, find out what you're up to? Uh, the website is maxwellsc.com. Uh, S for strength, C for conditioning, maxwellsc.com. Uh, please follow me on Facebook and uh, uh, like my Facebook page. And I'm also on Twitter, and I use uh, 
Instagram quite a bit. I'm always putting up videos of stuff I'm doing. You're a but social they can media get, guru. Yeah, well, uh, my girlfriend does it all. <laughs> I don't even know how to log in half the time. But uh, we, we do try to answer people. Uh, any answer, uh, uh, it, it is for me. She'll just type it. I'll just dictate it. But the uh, the, the contact, uh, 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 email contact on the website, uh, you, you can contact me there. We, ha- we try to answer all our emails. We get a lot, but we do our best to answer everything. Final question for you, Steve. What have you changed your mind about in exercise and or diet in recent memory or since we last spoke? What comes to uh, mind? Not so much diet. You know, I really, I really like this, uh, the Dr. Tilden's uh, food combining type yeah. diet. It works quite well for me, especially in the room, uh, because nothing's forbidden. Uh, it, it's all about digestibility as opposed to actual, you know, f- carbohydrate fat or proteins and uh, for exercise i really pretty much have come full circle back to my roots of high intensity training you know for the longest time i was kind of doing more volume based stuff and definitely took a little foray into this whole kettlebell thing and uh, became known for the kettlebell thing but in truth i would encourage people to uh go to uh the high intensity training i think it's more sustainable certainly safer and something that uh much better for your joints the, the jiu-jitsu is dangerous enough i don't need to make my exercise <laughs> dangerous. No, that's awesome cool and to everyone listening to find the show notes for what is probably one of the longest episodes i've ever done and steve is still packed full of energy and ready to go and i'm definitely flagging here and feeling (laughs) slightly more tired than i did at the start um hopefully it's not too noticeable Um, but to find the show notes for this episode and all of the episodes recorded go to corporatewarrior.org and there's a big long long list of stuff there and until next time guys thank you very much for listening i hope you enjoyed that before you head off head on over to corpwarrior.com to get your free ebook with six interview transcripts of some of my top guests including dr doug mcguff drew bay and bill de simone on how to optimize muscle gain fat loss and overall health in an efficient effective and sustainable way these transcripts are not verbatim deliberately instead they've been transcribed in an easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to quickly pick out what you need and start getting results to get your ebook head on over to corpwarrior.com that's c-o-r-p warrior.com and enter your email address then check your email for an email from me with a confirmation link once you click the link you'll be instantly redirected to a pdf version of the transcripts this episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I've ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly, and I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done, and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity training trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and how you can get $1,000 off software licensing when you place an order, that's right guys, $1,000 off, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $1,000 off software licensing when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field.
This episode is brought to you by the Resistance Exercise Conference, the science and application of strength training for health and human performance. Would you like to learn from the top strength training researchers, network and connect with other exercise professionals from all over the world, join a welcome reception on a Friday night to build relationships with other strength training professionals, experience an early morning workout from an expert trainer to kickstart your Saturday and get inspired, rejuvenated and focused on your strength training business I certainly do, and that is why I am attending and interviewing all of the speakers at the event. The Resistance Exercise Conference will be held on the 9th and 10th of March 2018 in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the Commons Hotel. To get 10% off your entry fee, head on over to resistanceexerciseconference.com, click the registration button, and enter Corporate Warrior 10 in the promo code field in PayPal. I'm very excited about this and I've wanted to attend for years. Sign up now at resistanceexerciseconference.com and get 10% off with promo code CORPORATEWARRIOR10 and I look forward to meeting you in person.